Our points leader, but after two wins in the last three races, Whit Baysmore now sits atop the standings. In top fuel, Tony Schumacher's four wins helped him lay claim to the points lead until Topeka, when Brandon Bernstein jumped to the number one spot. As we enter the second three-in-a-row stretch, can these guys hang on to their lead, or will there be another shakeup at the top of the Nitro Classes? Sports presents exclusive coverage of the $50 million NHRA Power A Drag Racing Series. Today, the chase for the championship continues with final eliminations of the 40th running of the Pontiac Excitement Nationals at National Trail Raceway, just east of Columbus, Ohio. And hello again, everybody. Marty Reed, Mike Dunn, along with you. As the drivers are ready to go, the fans are ready to go. All we need is the weatherman to cooperate. There is a threat of rain again today, but so far, so good as we're ready to go racing. Let's take a look at our top fuel ladder presented by Lucas Oil and check out the matchups. And there is your points leader, number one qualifier. The only car to dip in the 40s so far this weekend, a 448, Brandon Bernstein. Tony Schumacher, number two in the points, qualified number two, but... Don't be misled, that has not been a very consistent race car this weekend. And our first pair out is the number eight and nine qualifiers. And a big disparity in the performance end. We have Larry Dixon, the number eight qualifier, by nine one hundredths of a second, better than the number nine qualifier, David Grubbick. That's not normal, Mike. Yeah, it's pretty unusual to see that much of a gap between the number eight and nine qualifier. But it's one of those things where uh, David Grubbick couldn't get the combination just right, had some tire smoke, but was still able to qualify the whole nine position. All right, let's talk a little bit about the weather, because there is a threat of more rain. Yeah, there is. But currently, the temperature is 77 degrees, humidity 78 percent. Now, the track temperature, 97 degrees. That's the key, a little bit warm for this time of day. This is the altitude. is actually 3,500 and 30 feet above sea level. Larry Dixon will be in the left lane, and there is his numbers from qualifying. And you can see that rounds three and four yesterday, he was very good getting down this racetrack. He's also been very good here. As you look at the numbers on David Grubnick, only really one good effort to get down this quarter mile. But back to Larry Dixon. He has got a chance to set NHRA history. No racer has ever run four years in a row here at Columbus. Now, Shirley Muldowney has won four times at Columbus, but not four in a row. For two weeks in a row, Larry Dixon has put David Grubnick on the trailer. Four point, no shoot, hold on, this is going to get ripped wicked. Larry Dixon wins the round, but the parachute failure at the other end of the racetrack, an actual hole shot win, he had five 100s advantage in the bank. There you see what's left of the parachute. What a huge break for this race team. He almost hit that catch net. If he does that, the car's destroyed. Yeah, I know that firsthand. That catch net is not very forgiving. But luckily, they have extended the... Boy, you look at the parachute. Just lost it. It looked like it just broke right off the chassis right at that point. And here he is trying to get this thing stopped. Remember, very short racetrack here. Watch this. Larry Dixon did his job on the starting line. Got the advantage off the starting line, which is what he needed to get the win. Then at this point... Let's, let's try to get this thing stopped. God, remember, he was running 341 miles per hour at the finish line. Right there is Refugee Road as he goes across Refugee Road. That's where the track used to stop. And look at Larry. He is just furious. He is wondering what in the heck happened because this is the one track of any facility on the NHRA Tour you do not want to have a parachute failure. Well, you know, and this is the way his year's going. I mean, he finally got a car. It seems like it's really starting to come around. Then he has something like this, and obviously they're, they're going to have their work cut out for him. Hopefully there's not any major damage, but they're going to have a lot of work cut out to get that car ready for the next round. There's Don Perdome. Bill, you there? Larry Dixon just walking it off here, Larry. I know the situation is not a pleasant one, but uh, you're not happy. No, no, I'm pissed. <laughs> How's that? Uh, you know, you get to shoot. The shutoff area is so, it's short anyway, and it's really bumpy here. 
and you got your hands on the brake, you got your hands on the steering wheel, you can't take your hand off to go for the other shoot. You're, you're, you're along for the ride, and the only thing good about all that is we got the wind line. I just hope we can fix it. We got the championship winning crew, so uh, if anyone can do it, they can. I don't know if this takes the curse off it, but you want in a hole shot. I owed him one. Let's go back, take another look at it as uh, Larry was talking about not being able to get to the second shoot. Yeah, some drivers actually pull both shoots just for that reason, but Larry obviously, he just pulls the one shoot and uses the other one for the backup. Now what he's talking about with a rough surface, the car gets to bouncing and you're trying to get the thing stopped and you don't want to reach over and try to grab the other parachute because that's probably three or 400 feet that you're going to be traveling without any, giving any brakes as you reach over the parachute. And at that point, you really don't know what the problem is. The other shoot could do possibly do the same thing. Well, to say the least, we've had a dramatic beginning to our day with uh, Larry Dixon doing a miraculous job of getting this race car stopped. Let's point that out. Be without going into that net at the far end, that is absolutely spectacular. Let's talk about this racetrack because if you remember when we were here last year, it was an old surface and Jason Line and Taylor Laster both ended up on their lids. Yeah, the track surface was very, very slick last year, especially on the asphalt when he came off the concrete transition. But they have repaved the racetrack. They extended the concrete from 500 feet to half track, or 660 feet, and then put new asphalt to the finish line. Track surface, I talked to all the drivers and the crew chiefs, they love that, that surface. The problem is the shutdown area. They're still complaining about it because it's very, very rough in that shutdown area. We see the bikes have some problems down there because basically as, as you get bouncing, it's very hard to get the, the, the cars or the bike stop because it's you're losing a lot of time bouncing up and down rather than trying to get that thing settled down to get it stopped. This is Karen Stouffer from Friday qualifying. She was in the right lane when the bike uh, went tucking underneath her. Here's Lloyd Strauss yesterday in the left lane. Same symptom, same result. And remember, you're talking about 190 miles an hour. Then the very next pair down, that's Wesley Wells. He goes down as well. All three of those riders were A-OK. -okay. Larry Dixon, albeit a little hot under the collar, he is A-OK. -okay. But this shutdown area, it is the biggest frightening factor for these racers when anything goes wrong. So as we hear engines firing in the background, we'll get ready for our next pair. And that will mean Rhonda Hartman-Smith and Bob Vandergriff. Rhonda will be in the left lane, Bob in the right lane. Big changes on the team for Rhonda and it's showing some dividends. Virgil Hartman, her father, is basically taking more of a management role and allowing others to do the actual tune-up. Larry Frazier, John Stewart, among those that are taking care of the tune-up chores. As a driver, you've just seen Larry have this problem. Now you're the next pair up. What are you thinking? Well, it's one of the things you have to worry about because uh, normally you're just out there trying to remember you got to you know, obviously get a good rack time off the starting line keep that thing in the groove to get the good run but and just you know you don't really think about stopping the car but here that has to be in the back of your mind let's get an ad on uh, parker uh, what what do you have going with uh, larry dixon's team parker well marty i checked in with larry's co-crew chief donnie bender asked him about the extent of the damage he said the front wings the front wing in plates all the body work had been pushed up as it went through that gravel trap of course gravel extensively spread through the car his big concern the fuel system he said the gravel enters the vent on the front of the car will contaminate the entire fuel system they have a lot of work to do but remember this team does have a complete ready to go spare in their brand new third trailer so we'll keep posted on that right now we get ready for this next pair our second down the track today Cars in tire smoke. You see the belt coming off Bob Vandergrift, but Vandergrift will get the wind light. 513, 224 miles an hour as uh, he coasts on out and advances to second round competition. Let's uh, check in with Bill Stevens. Let's talk a little bit about Brandon Bernstein, who comes into eliminations today, the number one qualifier. You know, there was an old tradition with his dad, Kenny, when he was racing. Whenever he brought out a new car, he usually did well with it. And it looks like son Brandon is continuing that tradition, qualifying number one with that 448. Spoke to Tim Richards, the crew chief, this morning about the new car. I said, what is it about this team? You guys seem to get these cars dialed in immediately. And he said, well, today the cars are very similar. You really don't have to take a lot of time to get them to glue to the racetrack. Dave? And, Bill, I want to talk about funny car. Five 
five times this season, Whit Bazemore has lost the number one qualifying spot in the fourth and final qualifying session. This weekend, it was this man, Cruz Pedregon in the advanced auto parts car. First number one for this team since 1998. It has been a very long stretch. I talked to crew chief Wes Cerny. He said it was an ignition problem that they figured out. Now, if they can just be consistent, maybe they can go the distance. And Cruz will have Jerry Tolliver in the opening round of action in Funny Car. That's still to come. Right now, we're getting ready for Doug Coletta against Scott Wise. And there is Scott's numbers as uh, he's gotten down the racetrack very good in round number one, 465. Yeah, Scott Wise has been looking pretty good. Uh, you know, coming in this week, and the car's been running very well. Ran out of the box, like you said, Marty, we saw from 465. But then he kind of struggled a little bit here. Doug Coletta, he's been the, he's had the opposite week. In, this week. I mean, he basically struggled early and then kind of came out there and made his 467 run in the third round just to get a baseline and then came back and stepped it up and made a good run. Now, hopefully they can do that again today and they're going to need to get around Scott Wise. Doug is the only Kalita member family uh, that has not won here at Columbus. Uh, Connie won it back in 86, Scott twice in 94 and 95. He cuts an 009 light. 4.64 seconds later, he has got the win. You saw Scott having all kinds of tire smoke. Uh, that may be cutting the light a little too close. That is nine one ten one nine one thousandths of a second from being red. Daryl Russell, John Smith coming up next here in round one of Top Fuel. Now you're looking at the right front wheel on John Smith's Prestone Top Jeweler, and you're saying, why? Well, if you were with us, you'll know why. Here's what happened in qualifying. His last qualifying run, they were going for it, started applying the clutch, and the car just went airborne. John does a good job here right at this point. He's got to get out of the throttle. He does. If it went any farther, probably would have had one of those infamous blowovers. And remember, guys, last night, too, we told you about John Smith. He spent about four hours at the hospital last night complaining of some tightness in his back. Had a little bit of tingling in his fingers, but that all went away. The CAT scan was fine. He is back, but says he still has some muscle spasms and a very tight back he's dealing with. Daryl Russell, and there's Joe Amato saying, hey, that's a good start to my 60th birthday. That's right, Joe is 60 years old today, and he takes care of business 4.58 seconds, and that is Daryl Russell's 100th round of competition in Top Fuel as he picks up the win and moves on towards possibly a birthday present for the boss. Let's check in again with Parker. Well, Marty, today we're going to be eavesdropping with Doug Coletta's crewman, cylinder head specialist, James Riola. Now, he's behind the wheel of the tow vehicle. He and four other crewmen have already started the work for the second round of eliminations. They've pulled all the fuel lines, disconnected the ballistic blankets. These guys are flat out, and they're not even back in their pits. You can see the crew getting ready to start the process of taking the car back. And now let's check in with uh, Dave Reef. Well, normal maintenance is one thing for Larry Dixon. They will do all of that, the normal stuff, taking the blower and everything off, trying to prepare this car. But you can see that it has shed all of its skin, and there is about a quarter-inch layer of dust topping everything. They will go through this with a fine-tooth comb. Larry Dixon at the front of the car, replacing the nose wing, which will need to be totally replaced. But Guys, this is going to go above and beyond the turnaround here. Remember, with weather threatening, they're going to be pushing these guys as quick as they can. And this team has a lot of work to do yet. Yeah, right here, Marty. I mean, you got to watch everything. The, the guys in the back are doing the normal maintenance. But up front, you got Larry Dixon, Donnie Bender. A lot of times, he's usually in there looking at the computer. They're pulling all the panels off. They're getting, you see all the gravel down there at the bottom. And the main concern that they had was that travel going inside the fuel tank vent and going into all the fuel lines. That's the big concern. They'll pull the fuel tank out and try to clean that as best they can, but they also got to take all the lines off it too. That is not normal maintenance. 
they are getting a bit of a break because John Smith oiled down the racetrack. Now, he is not in a penalty situation. He has uh, two in the bank, so he's now down to one freebie. Uh, we won't bother going into all the rules on how you gain those back, but in essence, while all that's going on, that's extra time for these guys to be doing the job, and there it is, a big mess. Dave? Well, as you can see, the fuel line's coming off the back of the fuel cell. They're getting ready to replace that. Everybody getting involved with this one. Donnie Bender working on the blower. It's going to be a tough turnaround for this team. Yeah, it's going to be a little tough. We've got uh, rocks and a uh, tank and a fuel system. Everywhere in the whole car, we got to check all the electrical, all the fuel system, blower stuff, everything. Make sure all the rocks are out of there. So, because we leave one stone in there, it'll blow up on the next one. Right? You're looking at the blower here. Did this thing get uh, full of some gravel and dust as well? Yeah, just mainly dust. By that time, he had the injector shut, and there's just fine dust in there. So I just have to clean it out, and it should be fine. Yeah, Marty, you know, he's talking about one piece of gravel blowing that up, and he's, he's, de he's accurate about that. If one piece of gravel goes under that intake valve and hangs it open, it's going to blow the supercharger off. Or if a piece of gravel goes into one of the main fuel lines and plugs the fuel line up, it'll burn the motor up. So they have to be very, very careful about that. I wonder if Michael Schumacher works on the Ferraris whenever uh, they run into a problem. What do you think? Uh, he only no. gets 26 million. He probably want to raise to do that. I'll tell you what, Larry wants to be involved, that's for sure. And that's what's great about this sport. Okay, we have out. So while all the work continues back in Dixon's camp, we'll come back out trackside, get ready for Scott Coletta. There you see his numbers. He's uh, qualified number four. He'll be in the left lane up against Don Lampus. Uh, and Lampus, a very, very limited schedule, basically just trying to keep his license active while he continues the sponsor search. Yeah, you have to run a race car, uh, you know, basically makes some little laps every year just to keep your license current, and uh, that's what Don Lamb is doing. Plus the fact that he loves to race, and he's done a good job. I know he's got a little bit of help from Wayne Dupuis, who, who works, you know, crew chief for Joel Miles. He just came over there and made sure all his fuel system stuff worked right so he wasn't wasting any runs, and then he came out and, made, and he's made some nice runs. Former Rookie of the Year, Don Lampus is, and let's get more from Bill. And Mike, you may remember that Wayne Dupuy was the tuner for Don Lampus for a while before Don lost his sponsorship and then Wayne was hired by Joe Amato to tune for Daryl. Lampus is on fire as he goes through the traps and a 4.59 second elapsed time, 322 miles an hour, and Scott Coletta easily easily moves into the second round and boy the flames are still shooting out the back of uh, Don Lambs's top fueler. Yeah some big time engine damage there that thing's really burning right now uh, obviously burning all the oil and fuel in the mixture. Remember there's no fire extinguishers on the top fuel dragsters unless you have an enclosed canopy uh, mainly you know they want to keep the driver safe so uh, that thing's either going to burn itself out or you got to wait till the safety safari to come by and put the fire out for you. Let's go back and take another look and uh, watch this candle erupt. Yeah, Don Lambus had two hundredths of a second advantage on the start line, but he had a cylinder out as soon as he hit the throttle. Probably started to push the head gasket out, and I don't know if the, if the connecting rods come out, because basically what happens when the head gasket comes out, you can see the cylinder out right over there just as soon as he left the starting line, and immediately caught it on fire and it lost the belt. Otherwise, it probably would have done even more damage, but uh, big-time fire there towards the end. Well, while all this is going on, this helps Larry Dixon and his team because obviously there's more time taken to clean up the mess out on the track. Dave? Lots of sweat on Larry Dixon's brow, lots of sweat on Dick LaHaye's brow as well as everybody's getting involved in what is not a very normal turnaround at all. We've seen Larry Dixon here in the past working back with the fuel cell that they took out of that car. He's pouring nitromethane into it swirling it around in there as best he can, dumping it out, getting a flashlight, trying to see if there's any more debris or sediment in the bottom of there. And you gotta believe that since this guy's been with this team from 1988, he knows a lot about all of this stuff. And it's those years of experience right now that is definitely helping this team, Parker Johnstone. Well, Dave, no damage to repair down on Doug Coletta's car. It is a standard turnaround, 75 minutes. But as you mentioned, with impending weather, these guys are hauling the freight. Look at the sweat pouring off the brow of crewman James Riola's brow. It is intense down here. James, the car's been back 10 minutes. What have you and your crew accomplished in those 10 minutes? Well, we got it apart and evaluated, trying to uh, figure out what we got to do to get it turned around. And you can see the whole top of the engine's off, bottom end's out, the clutch is out. 
This is just phenomenal. I never get tired of watching these guys work. And as I said, no damage here, but still, the pace, unbelievable. The only conversation from the crewman is sending information up to crew chief Ron Tobler. Otherwise, it's quiet, it's orchestrated, but it is frantic. Down here with Don Lampus, who's one of the brightest smiles in drag racing, but uh, not smiling out really. You've got an expensive problem behind you. Yeah, well, you know, we're only running this race this year, so I guess we got a lot of time to, uh, to regroup. But uh, now i got to tell my wife we can't go to Nordstrom's. <laughs> you, you didn't get burned. There's a lot of fire, but you're all right. Oh, yeah, I'm all right. I got some gator, some power ready to pull me down. It is good to see Don at the track. We'd love to see him back more often and as we get ready for our next uh, pair. Look at the numbers turned in by Doug Herbert and Ed the Ace McCullough. Those are very good numbers, but I got to believe right now they're just looking to probably run a high 450, you know, 457, 458 right now. The problem with that is you got to remember, you can say, well, it's easy. Just, you know, take some horsepower away, take some clutch out and let it slow down. But if you do it too much and you don't get that tire spinning fast enough, you go into that dreaded tire shake and you can smoke the tires just as easy doing that. Josh Starcher, age 19, over in the right lane. There is Ed McCullough. Well, I don't think it's what uh, Ace really wanted, but he'll take the win light, 4.98 seconds, and uh, Doug Herbert is going to move on to second round competition. Yeah, that's definitely not what they wanted. I mean, he had a decent numbers early, but then just about 400 feet, you start seeing cylinders go out of that. I gotta believe maybe it's possibly an ignition problem. It sounded like he might have even backpedaled the thing. Let's go back, take another look. Yeah, I mean, you can see at this point, it's on a good run, and then right about, oh, he spun the tires, and then it started putting the cylinders out. He backpedaled the thing, and it just put like a, it looked like about, about three or four cylinders out. So we've got to take commercial break, and we still got more action coming your way here in Top Fuel. There's the Army of One. This is round 10 of the NHRA Powerade Drag Racing Series. We're at National Trail Raceway, the Pontiac Excitement Nationals, and getting ready for Tony Schumacher and Luigi Novelli. And there is Luigi. He'll be over in the right lane. Tough task for Luigi. Going to try and take out the number two qualifier and the man who's number two in the points. But remember, Tony was the points leader and looked like he was going to run away with it early, and the numbers have changed a little. Yeah, and he's really struggled. I'll tell you, for Tony Schumacher, right now, he's only been down the racetrack one time this weekend, and he ran a 451. The thing's been smoking the tires. So for him, he's basically not concerned with getting a good rack time. He's not going to go out there and give it away. He's just going to leave a, you know, make a nice, decent lead, leave when he sees the amber light come on so he gets a good start. Not a great start, but then he's really going to be focused on being ready if that car smokes the tires to have the back belt because he knows he still has a shot if he can get the recovery from taking out Luigi Novell even though it smokes the tires. Well, you'll see Luigi's numbers. Tony won this race in 2000 here at Columbus. His dad also won it in the funny car back in 1971. The Rod Father is going to have to come up with a big number right here. No contest. Schumacher, 4.55 seconds. That is Lowy Lap's time of this first round, 326 miles an hour. Schumacher did exactly what he's looking for. Not a great reaction time, but perfect for what he, the conditions he was in. Wanted to make sure it got down the racetrack. He, right at this point, he's waiting for that thing to start to spin the tires, and right now he's feeling a sigh of relief as that thing's still hooked up, and he knows it's on a great run. That is a great feeling for a driver, let me tell you. Let's check in with Dave Reef. And, Marty, you want to talk about blood, sweat, and tears? Look at Willie Walter. That's the man with the cut on his forehead. Been away from this team, came back this weekend when another one of their guys had an, uh, uh, some, some medical procedures done. That's the kind of commitment that's going on down here. You can see they've got the fuel cell put right back into that car. It's the same exact one. I asked Donnie Bender about why they did that. He says, we have another one that'll fit inside of this chassis, but we've never ran it down a racetrack. So we're going with the proven one. The steering rod back in the car as well. New front wheels put on, weld wheels, good. Your tire's all set to go. So they continue to build the motor back up. Thanks, Dave. This can be a tough business. And you're looking at the man who's making it tough for everybody in top fuel. That is Brandon Bernstein, the points leader. 
Brandon Bernstein's at the top of his game, coming off his sixth career victory at Topeka. With just 17 career races under his belt, Bernstein has been victorious in six of the seven finals he's appeared in and leads the points for the second time in his career. If he continues to ride the momentum, Bernstein could easily be on top come November. And let's add on to those numbers that you just heard about. There's his round record. Pretty phenomenal. 39 and 11. And six out of seven in finals. Bill? Well, if there's been any weakness at all in Brandon Bernstein's game this year, it's been at the starting line. Remember, he's got a couple of first-round losses due to fouls. And in yesterday's final qualifying session, remember, he ran a 460. And when he got out of the car, he said, I lost my concentration. I double-stepped. It cost me some ET. So he really has to keep his head in the game right now, or he could suffer another disastrous first-round loss. Well, he has got four career polls. He's never been upset in round one when he's been in this position. Mitch King's going to try and change that right now. Bernstein's in trouble, and he is out of here on the trailer. Mitch King who has had only one round win in his career, now has number two. He only managed 5.10 seconds, but the number 16 qualifier has just put the points leader on the trailer. Wow, is this a huge upset or what? I mean, Brandon went up there, he was played it safe on the tree, but boy, went out there and started spinning the tires. He tried to get recovered, but they made a move towards the center line, and at that point, he knew he couldn't get back on it, because remember, had he crossed the center line, he would have been disqualified anyway. Tough break for that team. It was 2002 back in Houston when Mitch put Larry Dixon out in round one as we take another look, and here he has done it to Brandon Bernstein. Yeah, just a tough break. It went into tire shake, started spinning the tires, got a little bit sideways there and close to the center line. He, he did the right thing. He knew he couldn't get back in the throttle. All he could do was sit there and watch M Mitch King pull away for the win. What this means for the points championship is now Tony Schumacher is one point behind Brandon Bernstein. Yeah. So the lead could be changing again today. The frustration on the face as we take a look at the ladder and it'll be Larry Dixon and Mitch King meeting again. This time in second round, Daryl Russell will have the lane choice against Scott Coletta. Over on the opposite side, it is Tony Schumacher and Doug Coletta with the lane choice there. We've got to take a commercial break. When we come back, it'll be time for Whit Bazemore and Funny Car. In fact, Whit will be the subject of our Powerade Power Time when we return to National Trail. Traditionally, Whit Bazemore has played the role of bad boy, but surprisingly this year with two wins and the points lead, he has changed dramatically. In this week's Power 8 Power Time, had a chance to sit down with him and talk about it, and he explained why. Well, I, I have to represent the sponsors and Matco Tools and Dodge a certain way, and I certainly have to represent Don Schumacher a certain way. And you know, sometimes, like right now, we're, we're running well. I just don't care about the other stuff. You are a lightning rod among fans. They either love you or they don't. Yeah. Did you start your career with that in mind, or how did it all come about? No, I, I don't know how that happened. I, I Actually, I think part of it uh, comes from having become the challenger to force. And obviously then, the big force fans, you know, of which there are millions of them, you know, I became the bad guy. What's your true feelings about John? He's a fierce competitor, you know, we have the utmost respect for him and, and the team he's built and all the success that, the success that they've had, but uh, they're hard to bring down. If they finish one, two in the championship and you're third, in my mind, you're second, because they are one entity. You're in the points lead and you've held it for more than one event weekend. What do you guys expect? Honestly, we expect to win the championship. We, we just have to work hard and stay focused and uh, the results will come our way like they have. But we, we can't make too many mistakes or all those guys are snapping right now at our heels. 
Let's take a look at our funny car ladder presented by Lucas Oil. You can see who has the lane choice with the number one qualifier, Cruz Petragon. First time in five and a half years that the cruiser has sat on pole. Over on the other side, there is Whit Bazemore. As, uh, he is the number two qualifier. He's got Jeff Arendt here in the opening stanza. And as we get ready on trackside, it will be Tim Wilkerson against Eric Medlin. And you're on board with Tim. This is a good matchup, Marty. I mean, these two cars are, are pretty consistent in these type of conditions. And uh, if you look at Eric's numbers there, he, he struggled in the first one, but then came back and just made some real nice runs. Uh, even though Tim Wilkerson is qualified a little bit ahead of him, it's a good matchup. There's the view inside the cockpit of the Levi Ray and Shout Monte Carlo. The numbers indicate where each of the racers qualified, 7th and 10th, respectively. Great drag race. Eric Medlin, 4.82 seconds to a 4.90 for Tim Wilkerson. There is the margin of victory at the finish line, a car length as Eric Medlin takes out Tim Wilkerson. So as we go back and let's check in on Top Fuel one more time, the biggest story of course is uh, Brandon Bernstein losing and almost taking out our camera and the giant killer is Mitch King. Let's go up to the far end and there's Brandon. Brandon Bernstein, the latest victim of Mitch King, you might remember a couple of years ago he beat Larry Dixon in Houston in that first round when Larry couldn't be beaten by anybody else, and I know you're disappointed. Yeah, very disappointed. You know, this Budweiser Lucas Oil team was doing a great job this weekend. You know, we were, we were flying and, you know, come out number one qualifier, and, uh, you know, it's just unfortunate. Uh, you know, the car car left okay, but then it immediately went up in, in smoke after that. I felt some, you know, vibration and smoke, and, and I tried to get back on it, but it was kind of sideways and was going towards the center line, so I was trying to avoid that. I had to lift, and, you know, by that time I locked. I saw, you know, Mitch, and he was going down there, so there's nothing nothing I could do then. We open the show by saying there's a tradition with this team of new cars performing, but that could be the end of that. All right, thanks, Bill. As uh, we come back to the starting line, you see Ron Caps getting ready to race against Phil Burkhardt, and you can check in with Ron Capp's diary every race week at ESPN.com. Over in the other lane, Phil Burkhardt, the 1999 winner here at uh, Columbus. In fact, the man he beat in that final just got eliminated in the first round, Tim Wilkerson. There is Phil's numbers. And that was a big win for Phil Burkhardt. I mean, basically came out of nowhere, just a uh, good race in the alcohol funny car race. He was just trying to get his foot, you know, feet wet and uh, did a great job. And in fact, his crew chief that day was Wayne Dupuy, crew chief for Joe Amato. I'll tell you, Ron Caps, that green slow car, they brought Roll Leong on board, and, it, and you look at his numbers there. I mean, this is what they want to do. They're not running the big numbers, but the car's going down the track. They're getting good information. Both Roll Leong and Dave Hutchins are able to go back there, and that's what they want to do, get it down the racetrack. Ron Caps has never lost to Phil Burkhardt. Well, he has now. Burkhart, 4.95 seconds. You saw Ron Caps. There's Roland Leong as the car went up in smoke. And Burkhart takes a step towards winning for possibly a second time here at National Trail Raceway. We've got to take a commercial break. There is some of the huge crowd that has turned out despite all the rain. We've had Whit Bazemore and Jeff Ferren when we return. Board with Cruz Pedregon, the number one qualifier in Funny Car here at the Pontiac Excitement Nationals. The Cruiser, first time since 1998 when he has been in the pole position. And the man he raced back then was a guy by the name of Jerry Tolliver. And guess what? Five and a half years later, the number 16 qualifier again is Jerry Tolliver. It's deja vu all over again, huh? Just like Yogi would say, and if it's deja vu again, guess what? Tolliver will take out the number one qualifier because that's what happened that day. Well, and it's a possibility because we saw what happened to Brandon Bernstein. And, and if, when you looked at Cruz's numbers, I mean, he ran that 476, but he wasn't consistent. They're still working on that combination. Jerry Tolliver right there, he's, he's ready to go, but 
back to Cruz, I'll tell you, West Cerny, I mean, they found some ignition problems that they've been having that's been plaguing this team. Now, that's one thing. You find the ignition problem, it makes a big number. Now they got to figure out how to do it consistently. So they're, he's, I mean, West Cerny's as sharp as anybody out there, but he's not real com you know, confident at this point. He's happy he ran the 476, but he wants to be able to do it a few more times before he feels real confident. The number 16 qualifier. Look at Wes Cerny. He doesn't know what to think of it. 4.98 seconds the elapsed time. And Tolliver, who has been struggling since Houston, gets a round win here against the number one qualifier. Another upset here, but I'll tell you what. Jerry Tolliver, they got down the track, put a cylinder out down track, but it was good enough to get around Cruz. Watch Cruz. He's going to go on the tire shake. He backpelled, did a very good job catching it quickly. But then when he got back on the throttle, it picked the front end. Watch Cruz on the right side of your screen. Right there, he backpedals. Goes into tire shake, gets back on. Look at lift the front end up, and it, it probably got up on the wheelie bar and then unloaded the rear tires. In other words, it picked the rear tires a little bit up off the ground and allowed it to spin a little bit more. Super slow mo, Jerry Tolliver. Jerry Tolliver had a decent run going early in the run. Then he had a cylinder go out down track. Look at that thing carrying the left front wheel as the clutch comes in. That thing was doing pretty good until the cylinder goes out. And Jerry has just put Cruz in the dead zone, Bill. And I'm not sure that Jerry Tolliver knows what happened six years ago. The last time the Cruz Pendragon qualified number one, you beat him in the first round. Is that right? <laughs> Let me tell you what. This funny car group is tough. I mean, one through 16 is tough. So anybody can step up at any time. I mean, Cruz obviously showed the world. They stepped up last night, qualified number one. This shit Quattro team just stepped. I don't even know he ran, but the wind lights, all I care about, it don't matter what you run as long as you get there first. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dave. Hi, Bill. Face a little less frenetic down here in Larry Dixon's pit. As some of the final preparations are basically cosmetic. Larry getting ready to fuel this bad boy back up. But you were just talking. You're glad you're not number one. No kidding. Because we've been, uh, well, for one, doesn't look like it's doing those guys any favors being number one. Both of them going knocked out. But, you know, second of all, you, we've probably been last pair. And that would have gave us that much less time to get this uh, Miller Lite hot rod uh, back up there for round two. Tough to believe that was the very first time ever Larry Dixon went in the gravel trap. As we get ready for Whit Bazemore and Jeff Arend. I, if I was Greg Anderson, I might not be real confident right now in pro style. He's the number one qualifier. There is Lee Beard coming off his 50th career victory as a crew chief just two weeks ago at Topeka. With Bazemore, of course, right now, this team, the baddest in funny car, Paul Smith. And his number 15 qualified car, Jeff Arend, trying to put Witt out of this race. Hot, straight, and normal. Witt Bazemore goes low at uh, 4.86 seconds, only four one hundred slower than uh, Eric Medlin's low for the round, 4.82. So let's uh, put a period on Cruz Pendragon's day. Here he is with Bill. What happened? Well, it shook the tires. I think uh, hard to say. There's a lot more, a little more heat out there, and uh, and uh, God, I just uh, we qualified great. We had a great run. When you make a run like that, these cars are on the edge of make, not making it, and uh, maybe we cross the, the cross the line. But uh, it's a great start for this team. We're going to build on this number one spot and uh, learn how to race the car. That's I have a lot of faith in this car, and for Advanced Auto Parts, uh, that just a uh, little uh, little bit of uh, comeback for us. So. Appreciate everybody, and it wasn't our day, and hey, hats off to the guy that made it down track. We'll get him next time. Major upset in round one. You're absolutely right. As we get ready to go to commercial break, Gary Dench will be up against Jim Head when we come back. There you see Gary Dencham's number. Do you know that all the years that Gary has been coming to this racetrack, he has one round victory? That's pretty amazing. Obviously, you would like to change that today. Uh, but it could be tough. I mean, Jimmy Brock this year, I mean, I, I consider probably one of the best young crew chiefs in the business. 
he struggled. I mean, obviously he can make the power. We saw the numbers that he ran that 479 qualifying, but he's also been beast for famine. I mean, either the car goes out and runs very well, or they have problems. And uh, they're hoping today that uh, it's it's the latter that they actually be able to you know run well and uh, get some wins today. Jim Head, a local boy, lives here in Columbus. In 17 years, it's now two round wins hit Columbus as it was no contest. Densham, 4.83 seconds, 315 miles an hour. Parker? Marty, it's been 41 minutes since Doug Coletta's Mac Tools top fueler rolled into the pits. There's been a change in pace from a flat out sprint to just a nice run now. These guys, if they have to turn this car around for four rounds of competition today, will average a loss of about seven pounds of body weight due to perspiration. James, I saw you rebuild these cylinder heads on Doug's car. Why not just have a pair of cylinder heads serviced and use those instead? Well, we do have another set that's ready to go if we hurt these but I'd rather stay with what we know and what's consistent. So we'll service them as often as we can. Now, how much do you have to do before this car is ready to fire? Uh, not too much. A few more minutes. It's amazing, Marty. I want to ask you a question. You know, fan at home is going to say, wait a minute, a piece of metal is a piece of metal. Why aren't they interchangeable parts? Well, you know, you would think so. And even with CNC machinery and stuff, there's still variations. I mean, when we originally went to the 75-minute rule, a lot of teams would actually change short blocks. They got away from that because they felt that it was, if you had an engine that ran good, even with the camshafts and everything, you, you kind of stuck with it, and they're doing the same thing with the cylinder heads. All right, we've got Bob Gilbertson and John Force, but there is uh, work going on in Larry Dixon's camp, Dave. Yeah, maybe a little additional drama. Keep your eye on Donnie Bender at the front of the Miller Lite Dragster right now. They've got some blocks under this car. At about the halfway point, I'm guessing this car is probably tweaked just a little bit, but take a look at some of the guys out here helping. All the school guys are over because Ron Caps went out round one. They're over here trying to help out, but that's pretty interesting. I don't think I've ever seen that too many times, Mike Dunn. Oh, I've done that a few times. Normally that's what happens when you wheel stand the car and it comes down hard. Uh, a lot of times we actually have to stick the thing underneath the bumper of the truck and then jack the center up because what happens is the bottom main rail sags, and if you get that sag in it, the car won't, won't work the same. So they're trying to get that sag in by raising that up, going past center, you know, getting the tension, and then they'll pull the blocks out and they'll check that bottom rail again and make sure that there is no sag in the bottom rail so the car will be able to repeat. So while we get that going on back there, John Force and Bob Gilbertson, if you were with us for NHRA Today, you know already that these two have met for the last four years in the first round. Force has won every single one of them. But Bob Gilbertson's running better. He's made it to a semifinal just a couple of races ago. Brand new car, new sponsorship. This team, and the, the odds someday have got to turn in their favor at this track. They've got a good chance today. It's not going to be easy. I mean, John Force is tough, but uh, we've seen a number of cars go out there and spin the tires. And if Bob Gilbertson can go down the racetrack, he's definitely got a shot at it. The string continues for John. He does have Bob Gilbertson's number at this racetrack. He's 4-0, four, oh, four straight years in a row. 4.86 seconds, 313. That's the numbers for John as he moves in to round number two. We got to take another commercial break. Stay with us. Still more, a lot more. You're looking at Tommy Johnson, Jr here at the Pontiac Excitement National. I'm Mark Green. Along with Mike Dunn, Bill Stevens, Dave Reef, Parker Johnstone, our entire ESPN2 crew, we're glad you're with us for this 40th running of this great event. And of course, if you may already know the addition of Johnny West to the Skull Blue team. What uh, you may not remember is the guy he's racing, and there is Johnny as they back the cars up, Gary Selzy. The last time these two met, if you remember, it was Bristol, first round. Tommy had low elapsed time at 4.79 of the entire round and got beat by a huge hole shot. So he owes Gary Selzy right here. Yeah, and that was a situation Tommy Johnson's basically his visor fogged up because that was very uncharacteristic of him uh, to do that. And I'm sure, I, I can guarantee you, he's going to make sure that his visor is not fogged up on this run. There you see Gary Selzy's numbers. Of course, he won here in Top Fuel in 1997, which was his rookie season. And this team...
they, they know they have a good race car. They just have not been able to go consistent rounds. Yeah, and that's the key on race day. I mean, they're, they're good in qualifying. Coming in here, same thing. They got better on each and every one of their runs, which is what you want to do. Uh, but now it's race day, different conditions. They need to be able to do the same thing today. Again, those numbers show where each of those guys qualified, 6th and 11th, respectively. Dead even off the top line this time, and you saw the tire smoke on TJ, and Selzy takes the wind light at 4.95 seconds. Johnny West, in his uh, debut with the team, not the kind of result that they were hoping for. Uh, definitely wasn't. And TJ really had this right at 300 foot mark. He's 300 of a second ahead right there. And then he starts spinning the tires. And that allowed Gary Selby to pull away right there about half track. Even with the cylinder out, he was still able to go a little bit faster than TJ. Watch TJ. Car was on a good run. He had good reaction time. He did his job right there. Had good numbers. Like I said, he was about, eh, about 200 of a second quicker at this point in the run right there. Still quicker to the eighth mile, but he was spinning the tires, and his eighth mile speed was much slower than Gary Selzy. About 50 mile an hour slower, and that was the difference. All right, Dave, what's going on? Well, about six or seven four by fours. You saw it. Guys jumping on the car. Did it as many as 10 times. Sometimes had two guys standing on the front of this chassis with Dick LaHaye's watchful eye looking right down the side of this car to make sure that they can can get it as true as they can. Actually, a funny story. Larry told me about a car that they broke a long time ago. Took it to legendary chassis builder Al Swindle's shop, expecting it to go in the jig. He did the same kind of thing. So, like Mike Dunn says, this goes on quite a bit. But uh, they're starting to button things up here slowly now. Larry Dixon's got the parachute working on the back side of the car, replacing that. The one thing I do find interesting, though, Dick LaHaye has yet to look at a computer, Parker. Hey, Dave, do you ever take a shop grinder to your tires at home? All the time. Are you sure? No. Well, look what they do down in the Coletta pits. And James, why is a crewman grinding Doug's rear tires? Oh, it just knocks off the rolled up edges from when it goes down the racetrack and peels off a little bit of the rubber. So we try to start with a smooth surface. So a little bit more consistent contact area then. That's all we're trying to do. Well, I, you learn something every day here in the NHRA, Marty. Well, and we always talk about how high-tech all these race cars are, and then we watch these guys bouncing up and down on the chassis. And hitting, using grinders on their tires. Well, hey, remember when NASA, they were on the moon, and one of the guys said, how'd you get it to work? Well, I just banged on it. So, you know, it worked for them. Use a hammer. And are we in a tractor pull or a drag race? I can't figure it out. Take a look at the numbers. This is a big round for Dell Worship. He's been in a bit of a slide. He's fell to second in the points. Remember, he had the points lead about, uh, well, three events ago as we uh, headed into that first three-week stretch. We've already talked about it, and he's up against a tough customer, Tony Pedregon. Yeah, he definitely is, but this is a good matchup. I mean, both of these teams can step up and run the good numbers, but they also have had some problems, so watch, the, watch this one. It's going to be good. Tony Pedragon had a bucking Bronco. Del Worsham had himself a good ride. 4.90 seconds later, he's into the second round, and he keeps pace with points leader Whit Bazemore. Almost identical to his brother Cruz. You're going to see the thing go out there, rattle the tires, go into smoke. He pedals it, gets back on it, tries it one more time, and this is going to pick the front end up. At that point, he knows uh, he sees Dell is long gone. Boy, he got her a little bit sideways, too, there at, the, at that point, and that was the end of his day. All right, so now let's check the ladder on Funny Car, and we'll be able to show you that the matchups have Del Worsham with the lane choice and John Force and Phil Burkhart. They're going to meet again. This, this is becoming a regular dance with these two. And then over on the other side, lane choice to Eric Medlin over with Bazemore. I don't know if that's going to be significant, but we'll find out. Gary Denton with the lane choice over Gary Selty. Well, if you're Greg Anderson, are you worried? You might be. Two number ones have been dumped already. Pro Stock next. Some of the thousands here at the National Trail Raceway for the Pontiac Excitement Nationals. And we have had some excitement already in Top Fuel and Funny Car. As uh, we want to tell you about our next stop next week, Canaan Filter Super Nationals will have Saturday qualifying, 6 o'clock Eastern, 3 Pacific. And then on Sunday, we'll be back on the ESPN 2 for NHRA Today at 11.30 a.m. And final eliminations, two hours worth, 5 o'clock Eastern, 2 Pacific. For more, log on to ESPN. Time now for the factory hot rods. The last time we were in Columbus, it was a rough ride in Pro Stock. Whoa, look out! Left is over! Big advantage for Jason.
in line and his pro stock thing. You know what? He's got problems again. The track has been repaved, so now the only problem these guys have is this guy. All right, and there you see the number one qualifier, Greg Anderson. And boy, <laughs> the way number ones are going, maybe he doesn't want to be there. As uh, you can see, that's the left side. Here's the right side, Jason Line and Ron Krischer, the teammate, uh, Jason, in the number three spot heading into today's final eliminations. First up is uh, Warren Johnson and Kurt Johnson, the father-son combination. There is Warren this year, and Kurt has beaten him once. Remember two years ago, we raced on Father's Day? This was really interesting because I asked Kurt, what are you going to give Dad for a present? He said, the afternoon off. The truth is, Warren won that day. In fact, he has beaten Kurt here three times that they have met at Columbus. The professor likes Columbus. He got his first ever round win at this track oh so long ago. Guess what? Kurt Johnson, 6.86 seconds later, is taking Warren to the trailer. It's the second time this year and the first time ever at Columbus, Kurt has given Warren the afternoon off. Let's check in with Parker. 55 minutes after Doug Gladys car arrived at his pits, it has been fully serviced turnaround as Doug's crew chief, Rod Tobler, now supervises the warm-up. You can see the crowd of fans in the background gathering around to watch. This is one of the great moments in motorsports when the fans can get right up next and close with. So as the warm-up continues back in the Mac Tools top fuel pit, we come back out trackside and get ready for our next pair of pro stock competitors. Young Dave Conley and Kenny Koretsky, Captain Chaos. You know, Koretsky's been coming to this track, what about 10 times trying to qualify. He finally has done it. He has really had a good season. They've done a great job. Dave Conley, of course, the 21-year-old phenom, he's just been uh, murder on the tree, mowing people down and has not lost in any of the first rounds that he has been driving with Bill Grumpy Jenkins horsepower, and there is the grump. Yeah, you got Bill Grumpy Jenkins horsepower on the one side, Larry Morgan horsepower on the other side, who has Bob Glidden helping in that department too, so two of the big names in the business. But Kenny Koreski, like you said, this is, this is the best he's ever looked. This car's running consistent, uh, been making good runs down the racetrack, but I'll tell you, he's got a tough customer with Dave Connolly. That kid, like you said, Marty, has just been tremendous on the on the reaction times, getting that good start off the off the starting line, and uh, never looks back after that. Well, the cars free stage. Who's going to go in first? Little bit of a staging duel going on. Conley's in. Dave Conley, first off the line, first to the strike. 6.86 seconds, 201 miles an hour, and he takes the wind light over Kenny Koretsky. And now we're going to find out if uh, the number one jinx is going to continue today because here comes Greg Anderson in the left lane. Now, if you're seeing these little white fluffy things floating around on the track, those are cottonwood. Uh, it's, the only thing that's hurting is anybody with hay fever. There, there's a better view of it there. It doesn't really affect any of the race cars. Now, as far as uh, tracking history, well, check on uh, Greg Anderson's update. Remember the record he set last year, 67 round wins. He's 33 up, two down so far this year. He's still on pace for 80. Mark Powick, who makes a habit of qualifying every other race, is in the other lane as the number 16 qualifier, and he's hoping for a little more deja vu. Yeah, he wants the same look we saw in the fuel categories, but it's going to be awfully tough. Greg Anderson, I, I think unless something breaks, uh, he's pretty much going to get this. I mean, he's been on his game. He's been doing a good job on the starting line. Obviously, the car makes good passes pretty much every time it goes down the racetrack. No. 
6.83 to an oh so close effort. The margin of victory just three one hundredths. Greg Anderson, for the 24th time that he has been on the pole, has survived the first round, but a 007 light. And look at the margin there, almost a third of a car length. Let's go to Dave Reef. Well, Marty, as everybody knows by now, the gravel trap not very friendly to the Miller Lite dragster, but the work is complete. There you see the old nose comb, the old wing, couple of body parts, and the parachute, the actual parachute that came off the car. It's very easy to figure why that thing came off when you just hold it up and go like this. That's why the parachute comes off. That's why the Miller Lite dragster goes to the sand trap. Oh, how thin it can be sometimes as we get ready for Jake Coughlin. And uh, talk about the fact that we're in Columbus, Ohio. And look at all the guys that were in today's race that are from Ohio. A lot of good racers here in Ohio. You know, a lot of them like this area to, uh, to build engines and stuff. And uh, Jake Coughlin, I'll tell you, with Stevie Johns, this is a good matchup right now. I mean, Steve Johns, he's been running good numbers. He's been making good runs, but he's still a little bit inconsistent. Uh, he needs to get this thing down the racetrack because Jeggy, obviously, is a tough customer. Well, it's Jake's 150th career event as a pro in front of the hometown fans. Doesn't want to go out early. Oh, and he drills him on the line. And the win light to Steve because he drives around him. 6.83 and the margin of victory, six ten thousandth of a second. Jake did everything he could. He had 600's advantage and there's the margin at the line. Oh, so close. Wow. So we've got to take commercial break as you go riding on board with Jake. You can see the move he had at the beginning. Stay with us. Back here at the 40th running of the Pontiac Excitement Nationals at National Trail Raceway. Glad that you're with us. The sun is beaming down right now. It's the warmest it's been all weekend. In fact, the driest it's been all weekend. Now, we have found out that there was a problem on Tony Schumacher's Army of One top fueler. You can't really see it from here, but the wing area there, Mike, what's going on? Left end plate right towards the other end. It broke down toward the bottom of it. Luckily, it caused the car to move to at the about the thousand foot mark, but luckily it stayed intact. Otherwise, it would have made a much harder move. Let's check in with Parker. You're looking at David Grubnick's rear wing end plate, but it's on the back of Tony Schumacher's car. Now, these end plates help to channel the air underneath the rear wing to maximize downforce. On the first round of eliminations, Tony Schumacher's end plate broke, shattered the carbon fiber and the honeycomb. Tony had a big moment at about 1,000 feet, had no idea why. They found the problem. They just don't know the cause. All right, thanks for the update, Parker. Let's uh, show you the rest of what's happened in round number one of Pro Stock. Mike Edwards in the left lane, Ricky Smith in the right lane, and watch the reaction time because Mike Edwards is never that late, but he was. And Ricky Smith in a hole shot is going to take the win. 6.89 seconds to the quicker, but losing 6.86. Then that would bring up uh, Bruce Allen and J.R. Carr. And J.R. giving up quite a bit over the performance side. So uh, he was taking a shot at the tree and unfortunately took too much of a shot and went red. So Bruce Allen runs it out to 6.87 second blast at 200 miles an hour to move into second round action. Then that would bring us up to Jason Line against Ron Krischer. Jason, of course, teammate to Greg Anderson, number three qualifier against the number 14 qualifier of Ron Krischer. Jason was first off of the line and first at the other end at the stripe. 6.82 seconds later, at 202 miles an hour, he takes the wind light to move on to round number two. And then Larry Morgan, right from Newark, which is just a little bit further east from where we are in Hebron, Ohio. And a bit of a staging duel between he and Daryl Alderman. Who would be the beneficiary in the end? Well, after 16 seconds of waiting, the advantage went to Larry Morgan, or I should say to Daryl Alderman, but it was Larry Morgan able to drive around 6.85 seconds, 201 miles an hour. So here are the matchups now for round number two. Greg Anderson has lane choice, as does Steve Johns. Over on the other side, it will be Larry Morgan and Jason Line with the lane choice there. 
We've got to take a commercial break. When we come back, we'll get you caught up on what happened in first round of Pro Stock Bike here at round 10 of the NHRA Powerade Drag Racing Series. Well, if you were with us yesterday during our qualifying broadcast, you are keenly aware of all the problems facing Angel Savoie off the racetrack. If you're not, let's bring you up to date. If you remember back at Atlanta, Angel told us she was having difficulties at home. Well, it came to a head recently when her 30-year-old husband, Nikki Savoie, former LSU standout football player, forcibly entered her house, according to police, with a gun and threatened her and fired one shot into the floor. He has been charged with domestic violence. Friday, Angel and I sat down and she talked about what's going on. I, I really don't want to get into the actual events, although I do want to set the record straight that the police report that was put out on the internet is not correct. I mean, there are some things that are correct, but most of it is, is not what happened. Um, what happened is that my husband and I are living everyday normal lives like everybody else out there, and just because I'm on TV racing or, you know, have a career in the public, it doesn't mean that what happens behind closed doors of my home is your right or everybody's right to know. I mean, I do have a private and personal life and there are a lot of things going on in my life that I, I hadn't shared completely with everyone. My dealership being the biggest and the scariest part of my life right now, it's failing bad and fast and I'm trying to get rid of it. I'm building a new home. I mean, we just our marriage has the normal pressures of everyday lives that everyone has on them and it came to a head one night and we had to come to a decision on what we were going to do and if we wanted to continue being together and that's the bottom line and, and that's something that I'm dealing with as well as trying to do well on the racetrack for my sponsors and my team and my team members and my fans and life is hard enough as it is without having to have it displayed to the world and having to answer questions. Are you going to be able to focus? You know what, I've, I've actually have won more races more often when my life is in shambles than I have when nothing's going on. It's an outlet for me when I get on that Suzuki. I know that there's nothing else in the world that's going on except for what I'm about to do. So it gives me a chance to get away from the real world, get away from my life and just do a good job on the track. And it's actually a, a high for me and a relief for me to get away from what's going on. I think I'll be able to be more focused this weekend than I am when nothing's going on. And as we take a look at the Pro Stock Bike Ladder presented by Lucas Oil, you'll be able to see that she has been able to focus just fine. Thank you. As you see, Andrew Hines, his fourth pole of the year. And uh, he'll have Riddell Harris. And, and uh, there is Angel, qualified number three. And the bike has been running very consistently. And she has been cutting very consistent lights throughout all of qualifying. So let's show you what happened in round number one of Pro Stock Bike. And let's start it off with Angel. She's in the left lane against Mike Berry. And again, very consistent, running in the teens. She stops the clock at 7.19 seconds, 185 miles an hour. Take another look. Like you said, Marty, she looks very smooth here, just doing her job. Even though she's bouncing down the racetrack, she's keeping that bike upright and straight down the middle of the lane. One of the best surprises has been Steve Johnson's performance throughout the race weekend. He's in the left lane against Michael Phillips, and he takes the win in first round action. 7.25 seconds at 183 miles an hour. Then it was up to Sean Gann and Craig Treble. And Gann edges out Treble. 7.21 seconds, 185 miles an hour. And you can see it was awfully close at the finish stripe. Then the brand new SNS Buell with Brent Collins on board in the left lane against Keith Dennison. It's Dennis. You hear the Buell getting sour. He get Collins gets out of it. Dennis goes 7.28 seconds, 182 miles an hour. Tough break for Fast Freddy. Sound like it got into second gear and then just wouldn't go into third gear. Hit the rev limiter and at that point his day was done. So that brought us up to number one qualifier, Andrew Hines. Could the number 16 qualifier take him out? Well, Riddell Harris cut a perfect light, but at the other end, 7.12 seconds is just unbeatable, and Andrew is in to second round action. Gino Scali, defending power eight champ, up against Chip Hunter. Hunter makes it easy as he goes red. Scali goes 7.19 seconds, 185 miles an hour. That would bring up the other Harley, GT Tonglet, up against Vermont, and it was GT. 7.20 seconds, 179 miles an hour. Not much of a contest in that one. Finally, it would be Antron Brown and Matt Smith. Good race. And
Megatron, though, would take the win. Both of them running 7.29 seconds, 182 miles an hour. But watch Antron on this run. Marty, this is just not experience. This is physical ability right there. I mean, to be able to take that bike and move it over in the lane, that thing was laying on its side. What a great job. All right, so here are the matchups for round number two in Pro Stock Bike. Hines and Scally have lane choice over Brown and GT Tonglin. Then over on the other side, the lane choice goes to Steve Johnson and Angel Savoie. So when we come back, it'll be time for Nitro. That's right, get those fumes and get your earplugs. Top fuel when we return. Back here at the Pontiac Excitement Nationals, the 40th edition of this great event. The sun is still beaming down, and uh, it's getting awfully warm on the racetrack. And we're getting ready for a second round of Top Fuel. And if you missed first round, you missed a lot. And first off, take a look at what happens to Larry Dixon. The chutes literally just come tearing off. He goes into the sand at the far end of the racetrack and is absolutely furious. Did not do a lot of damage, but enough that the crew actually had to help straighten the frame. Then we had upsets. Not just one, but two. Number one qualifier, Brandon Bernstein, goes out against Mitch King. And you can see the dejection on his face. And then in Funny Car, Cruz Pedregon. First time in five and a half years, he's up against Jerry Tolliver, the very guy who beat him five and a half years ago when he was the number 16 qualifier. He did it again. So, take a look at the top fuel ladder presented by Lucas Oil. It is Larry Dixon with the lane choice. The car is back together. They are ready to go. And Daryl Russell with the lane choice over Scott Coletta. Over on the other side, Tony Schumacher and Doug Coletta have the lane choice there. And that's going to be our first matchup, that last one you see. Doug Coletta and Doug Herbert. It will be Doug Coletta in the left lane. Herbert, or I should say Herbert in the left lane. I got my ducks mixed up. Coletta over in the right lane. Let's get a quick update from Parker. James, last time we saw you were servicing the engine. Since then, you've towed the race car down into the staging lines. You've done a final inspection of the engine. We saw you strapped dug in. When do you eat? As soon as I can find a second. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, this is not that second. I can guarantee you a little bit of a surprise here. I mean, mostly uh, everybody's been taking that left lane that's had la lane choice, and uh, Doug Coletta, obviously, they see something, and uh, they're over the right-hand lane right now. Let's get more from the bill. And, guys, both of these Dugs are on the chase course. Doug Coletta wants to keep pace with the points leader. Brandon Bernstein, who lost in the first round. Tony Schumacher's still alive, and remember, coming into this race, Doug Herbert left and around behind Larry Dixon as they fight for a better position in the top ten. You're right, and the last six times that these guys have come head-to-head, -head, Doug Coletta has won. But, you remember the last time Herbert did beat Doug Coletta, it was Sonoma, 2002, the site of his last win. The key here is, like you said, Marty, the sun is out, the track is a much hotter, trickier condition than the first round. They're going to have to tiptoe their way down through this racetrack. Tire smoking affair. Doug Coletta, 4.85 seconds, takes the win. Man, both cars, I mean, we knew it was going to be a little bit slick out there, and obviously they backed it down a little bit. They weren't very aggressive early in the run, just anticipating this. But then just as they started to make the transition onto that new concrete, you saw the big Goodyear start to spin the tires for both cars. About the same point, you see Doug Coletta on the left side had a lot of cylinders out, but was still able to get the win by just that much. Let's go super slow-mo on Doug. Like I said, once again, I mean, he didn't have a big tune-up on there, only 220 to the 330-foot to the mark, which is right about there. But shortly after that, right there, they start spinning the Goodyear. Had at least two cylinders out at that point. He's just legging it to the other end, and luckily he got there ahead of Doug Herbert. Let's check in with Dave Reese. And Marty, back down here in the water box, the only noticeable change you'll see on Larry Dixon's car is the front wing. It's from the Vogue Miller car that we saw at the last three races. Finally, when everything was put back together, Dick LaHaye, Donnie Benner had a chance to talk about tuna. They said they were very happy with their car's performance. Maybe a bit of a clock malfunction robbed them of a little ET. They they felt like their car actually made about a 459, 460 pass. They do not want to beat themselves. So they're slowing it down. Not by taking clutch out of it at the starting line, clutch out of it in the middle part of this racetrack is a team that once couldn't be beat. 
just make sure they don't want to beat themselves. All right, thank you. As we get a look at Dick LaHaye, and uh, let's check in with uh, Bill. Doug Coletta, somebody goes fishing for a big number now. They're going to get an empty hook, and that uh, round just proved it. You can't get cute now. Yeah, I tell you, that was a great round for this uh, team. You know, getting by those guys are tough, and, you know, Mac Tools, Red Line, all, it was just a huge round for us. Uh, you know, Herbert, I'd seen him out there close to the finish, and uh, I just feel, still feel lucky we got by him. Yeah, he was holding his breath from half track on. All right, thanks, Bill. As you take a look at Mitch King, and, uh, he has actually won two rounds now because, uh, remember, back at Houston in 2002, he upset the guy in the other lane, Larry Dixon, in the first round there. In fact, that broke Larry's streak of 30 consecutive races without a first-round loss. And I guarantee you, they know that. They remember it. They're not taking this car lightly, especially with everything that happened to them in the first round. That's exactly right. And I, uh, from Larry Dixon's standpoint, he is very confident in his crew. He knows he has an excellent team there. And he's not even thinking about what happened in the first round at this point. He is just concentrating on doing his job. And if everything works right, he knows he's got a good chance of getting the win. Well, I'll tell you what, Dixon was vulnerable. You saw him have to pedal the car. It got down the track quicker than Mitch King, 5.26 seconds at 276 miles an hour. Dave? Down with Don, the snake Perdome and Don. It was only a second round win, and Larry did a great job. But let's face it, after what happened in this first round, this team did a great job. It's got to give you a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, it sure has. Yeah, it's the same team from last year. The whole Miller-like uh, group's doing a great job. And I knew when it went out there in the dirt that they'd get it fixed. That wasn't our problem. It's just dealing with the heat here today and uh, hopefully waking up the winter circle. How about Larry right there, guys, too? Catching it. Yeah, he did. He caught it early. It was a good piece of driving. Take another look. Yeah, Larry's been doing his job. Won the first round on a hole shot. This time it goes into some tire shake and immediately into tire smoke. Just over clutched, overpowered at that point, but he caught it very quick. Got back on it. Then shortly after that, starts putting some cylinders out, similar to what we saw with Doug Coletta, but it was enough to carry him for the win. Bill? Larry's just about out of the helmet when he came around the corner. <laughs> around the corner in the shutdown area his eyes were wide open he knew that he just dodged a big bullet but you know what Larry you're going to the semis who would have believed it? <laughs> yeah uh, we've been dodging bullets all day it seems like you know but middle eight team's doing a great job the crew's uh, just to get up there with everything that we had happen after first round and get the car up there no leaks no brakes no runs drifts errors you know and uh, got the wind light and that's all that matters we're not qualified today we're racing uh, driver finesse is going to be so important the rest of the day if the sun stays out First semifinal for Larry Dixon since way back to Houston. That gives you an idea just how much of a struggle it has been. Right now, we're getting ready for Scott Coletta over in the right lane. Daryl Russell in the left. And if Daryl Russell does not keep pace, he would surrender seventh place in the points back to Dixon. Yeah, Daryl Russell, I mean, they, they look very good, but as we're seeing, the track temperature is really kind of throwing these guys a, a number right now. And the one thing about this latest Goodyear tire is it works very good in the good conditions. They can, you can put a lot to it, but when the track gets hot, it seems like they have to actually take more out of it than the previous generation of tire to make sure it gets down the racetrack. You can see the track temperature, 114 degrees get right at the limit. They feel like about 115 degrees with this tire is right at that point where it really starts getting touchy for the for the team to be able to make the adjustments. We heard talking, you know, Dave talking about taking clutch off of it. Normally what they do is these are centrifugal clutches. They apply like levers. So what they do is they take some weight off of those levers and it just doesn't apply the clutch as hard. In other words, let's the clutch slip a little bit more and hopefully you don't get into the tire smoke. This is a round two rematch from Atlanta when Scott Kalita won that one. Wayne Dupuy and the birthday celebration will have to wait a little bit longer. There is 60-year-old Joe Amato and Daryl Russell trying to give him a birthday present today. And he's two rounds down and two to go. Wow, well, this was an excellent run. And he had lane choice and took the left lane, uh, unlike the first two pair. And I'll tell you, they made the right choice. Look at it bouncing that left front tire out there. Definitely had this stuck. To run a 459 at 318 in these conditions is a great job. So as we come back to the starting line, we get ready for Tony Schumacher in the left lane, who can take over the points lead if he wins this round over Bob Vandergrift. Let's first check in with Bill. 
Darryl Russell yesterday in qualifying, you get down there with a couple of 450s, and today you've got just as good a car. Yeah, I tell you, it's a, it's a brand new race car. Uh, we just debuted it this weekend. I tell you, it gives me a whole new perspective. The side panels are a little bit lower, and now I can actually see my competitor for the first time. I've never been able to see that before, so it's kind of unique. I saw Scott the whole way down the track, did about half track, and then we just started pulling on him. But man, that's great. We've got a really good car, it's consistent. These conditions are a little tricky, but I tell you, this is a lot of fun right now. But DZ, Mac Tools, and all you guys, Keystone, thanks a lot. We're going to the next round. Remember, he's been the runner up here two out of the last three years. You got to believe his numbers got to come up sometime. I don't think I'd want to see anybody over there because that would mean they'd be behind me. Thank goodness. See ya later. Don Schumacher looking on and Son Tony behind the wheel. As we mentioned, the Army of One can retake the points lead with a win right now. Welcome back to the points lead. Tony Schumacher, 4.60 seconds, 322 miles an hour. As he coasts it on out, we'll show you the semifinal matchups. There it is with the lane choice going to Daryl Russell over Larry Dixon in the first of our two semifinals. And then Tony Schumacher by a bunch over Doug Kalitta. When we come back, it'll be time for second round action in Funny Car. All right, let's take a look at our Funny Car ladder presented by Lucas Oil. And you'll see that Del Worsham and John Force have the lane choice on one side of the equation. Over on the other, it is Eric Medlin and Gary Densham. A potential teammate matchup there. Uh, either way, it could be Team Force or it could be Team Schumacher, depending on who wins on that side of the ladder. We get ready now for Del Walsham and uh, Jerry Tolliver. Del, closest to you. Both cars in smoke. What a recovery. I mean, he had to he had to think that this thing was long over. He recovers, sees Jerry go up in smoke and takes the win. A 619 to a 624. Those are elapsed times from well, way back in the early 70s. This was a great job. Right here where he thought was when he's looking at that left side wall, he figures his day's done. But then he looks over after he gets it straightened out and sees Jerry smoking the tires. Dell, one of the best in the business at working that throttle, getting it back hooked up and just carried that momentum to just barely get by at the finish line. Look at that. What a great job. Take a look at that as half a car length, the difference. Watch this thing. He smokes the tires first before Jerry Tolliver. This thing makes a hard left hand turn heading towards the wall. Like I said, right there, he kind of figures it's done. And then look at him. Not even full throttle. Watch the injector blades. Now he starts to get into it, and he knows it's hooked up, and he goes into full throttle and starts chasing Jerry Tolliver down. Just a great job there. And there is Dell. Let's go to Bill. Hey, thanks for the driving lesson. Whew, I tell you what. It's not very often I have to pedal the check of Shook's Grand Guard. It rarely smokes a tire, especially in competition, but uh, it just smoked him right away, you know. And it was just, I just kept working. I saw he smoked the tires, and at that point, you just wanted to do whatever you can, you know, keep the good hooked up. Finally, you know, they got hooked up and went down there and got by him, and it was making some pretty ugly noises, and uh, he blew back by me after the light, but I saw my wind light up. Hey, when that happens, are you, like, talking out loud in the car? I'm probably cussing out loud. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Woo! I'll tell you what, I'll tell you why he's uh, giving a big sigh of relief. He's trying to narrow the gap with that guy right there, Whit Bazemore, and he's only two points ahead, of, of basically one round ahead of uh, John Force. And as uh, Whit backs up, we've also got Eric Medlin, who went to his first final uh, last time out. And in this week's Eric Medlin Diary, well, Eric talked about his feelings going into that first ever final as a driver. I've been in, a, you know, almost 100 finals between the Syntec car, the GTX car, and the AAA car. So there really wasn't a whole lot of, of surprises there. I knew what to expect, only you got to try to calm your nerves a little bit more. And really, it kind of calmed me down seeing all the crew guys from all the different teams walking up there to watch this. Uh, I think maybe just to watch and see if I could pull it off with all these guys behind me. And I think we came real close. We came up a little bit short. 
and uh, it just makes you a little bit more hungry to do it next week. Next week is now today, and there you see uh, Eric's 2004 numbers as he is currently in fourth place behind uh, the boss. In fact, it's a team force, third, fourth, and fifth. Force, Medlin, and Detchum in the points right now, and there is Witt's stats for right now, and definitely the baddest hot rod and funny car, and you're looking at it. There's White Michelle. Six seconds, 302 miles an hour, and your funny car points leader is now on the trailer. Wow, Whit Bazemore had six hundredths of a second advantage off the starting line, but shortly after that, he started running into problems. Eric Medlin made a nice clean run. Let's see if we can tell with Whit. I don't think the thing was spinning the tires and probably put a cylinder out because it definitely slowed down a bunch. Five of the last six races, as you take a look at the photo finish, Whit has gone all the way to the finals. This is the first time in that stretch he hasn't even made it to the semis. Yeah, let's see if we can uh, tell what happened, but uh, one, of those, one of those deals. This is a huge win for Team Force. And uh, Eric, yeah, high-fiving at the far end. Bill? Well, last year it was another driver in this car who was causing Whit Baysmore all kinds of nightmares. It was a year ago that there was another driver in this car giving Whit Bazemore all kinds of nightmares, and Eric Medlin, you just gave Whit another one. Well, that guy's given plenty of people this year nightmares, including us. That's a phenomenal team, but uh, these guys right here working on this thing are the best in my heart, so we still got a long ways to go. We got to make it to the final here, uh, but we're doing good making it to the semis. We're doing good, but uh, those guys in that silver excursion out there deserve all the credit. Let's pan the camera over to them. That's right, his crew coming up to tow him back to the pits. Thanks, Bill. As we come back, look at the dejection on Whit Bazemore's face. As they thought they were going to be uh, in the hunt again today and get stunned here in the second round. And there is the crew that he was talking about. And the 75-minute turnaround begins anew. Gary Detchum in the left lane. Gary Selzy in the right lane. There are Gary's numbers. Yeah, I mean, Gary Selzy, uh, you know, he doesn't have a lane choice. And we've noticed that most of the teams with the lane choice are taking the left-hand lane right now. With Bayport did not have lane choice. It might have affected the run. Maybe Lee Beer took a little bit of too much tune-up out of it and just uh, slowed down a little bit. Hard to tell what happened, but it's tricky track conditions. And this is something that right now, that man right there, Gary did for Jimmy Proc, haven't done real well this year. And, and uh, it's one of these things that they're going to have to get better at. Uh, Jimmy Proc, like I said, is as talented as anybody out there, as is crew chief Mike Ness with Gary Selzy. Two very good young crew chiefs here. There is Mike Neff. He turns the wrenches on the Dodge Hemi. Gary Selzy, who had won only like one round in uh, <laughs> a long time, has finally broken through. He's going to the semifinals. He'll carry Team Schumacher's colors, 4.95 seconds. And for Gary Densham, 17 years, he has won two total rounds here, has never made it to the semifinals. Now let's go back, taking one more look at uh, the points leader, Whit Bazemore. As uh, you mentioned, had the advantage at the starting line, but then started having problems and ended up on the short end at the far end. And that's where we find him with Bill. When you've been out here a long time, you know how the game goes. Sometimes the wind light's yours and sometimes it isn't. Well, that's exactly right, Bill. And it's, uh, you know, it's just part of the, part of the sport. And that's why, uh, you know, that's why uh, you can't uh, be a winner Saturday night and, you know, not show up Sunday. You've got to earn it. And uh, we got outrun. But uh, I'll tell you what, the Maco Tools guys are doing a great job in dodging everybody. But uh, we don't like losing, and we really don't like losing to, the, to those guys at all. That's clear. And it will be interesting to see how it shakes out in the points. 
because as of right now, Del Worsham has cut the lead down to 61. Here is Phil Burkhart, and he has got a big assignment because John Force is in third place in the points, Chase. And that's who Phil is running against now. This is the sixth time this year that these two have gone head-to-head. -head. Well, Phil Burkhart loves racing John Force, and uh, that's one thing. And he also loves this racetrack. Like we said, he got his first win here in 99. And I'll tell you what, just those two things right there, Phil Burkhart is going to be pumped up, but that man right there, John Force, he can get pumped up too when he has to, and uh, he knows he's going to need to be ready for Phil Burkhart. As you see the crew chiefs go in, make those last final adjustments. Phil beat John back at uh, Phoenix, did it again at Las Vegas, went on to win the event, but then he fouled out against John at Bristol. Came back to beat John in Atlanta, and John came back at Chicago in a great race. 4.83 seconds to a 4.85. It was spectacular for everybody in attendance. This is always a good matchup, just based on what you said, Marty. They always race each other very, very tough. Red light for John Force. Phil Burkhart smokes the tires. He hands the win to him. Phil just coasts on through. John is going to be kicking himself. First red light foul of 2004 for John. And it comes at the most inopportune time because Eric Bedlin did exactly what he needed to for the team. And then John doesn't follow through. I mean, John gave this away. This was just a mental breakdown right there on the starting line. He did this a number of times last year. Uh, this time it bit him. We knew he was going to be up for uh, Phil Burkhart, but uh, definitely a big mistake there for John Force. Yeah, you mentioned last year he did it a total of four times. And take another look at John. I mean, it was by a bunch. There is uh, Phil at the far end. It wasn't even close. He was almost a full hundred. Take a look at the uh, semifinal matchups. It was lane choice to Dell Worsham over his teammate Phil Burkhart. And in the other side, it will be Eric Medlin with the lane choice over Gary Selzy. Let's go to Bill. Well, you had a little John Force kind of luck there, sir. He fouled out, and you smoked the tires, and you know the rest of it. Oh, exactly, but we'll take him any way we can get him. You know, John and I have been battling it out all year. I love beating him just because he gets so much recognition, but, uh, you know, for Mac Tools, Checker, Shucks, and Craigans, we're in Mac Tools' hometown. I won this race in 99. We had a little bit of luck then, too. He did in the Nitro Fish car, his first national event win ever. So, as we get ready to head to break, the surprises continue to happen here at National Trail Raceway. Pro Stock, when we return. We're at round 10 of the NHRA Powerade Drag Racing Series. There's a total of 23 in the championship chase, and boy, have the points been changing today. As we head into second round action of Pro Stock, here are the lane choices. It goes to Greg Anderson and Steve Johns over Kurt Johnson and Bruce Allen, respectively. And then over on the other side, Larry Morgan, that's the matchup we're going to see first. He has the lane choice over Ricky Smith and Jason Lyne over Dave Conley. So as we get ready, you're looking at Larry Morgan. Remember last year we showed you uh, all the times that he failed to qualify throughout the first part of the year? Do you realize he now he has the second longest active qualifying streak at 19 races, now 20, including this one? Number one, of course, is Greg Anderson at 33. That gives you an idea how hard it is to just make the field in pro stock. Bit of a staging duel going on again. Point eight nine seconds to a quicker but losing 687. It's the third hole shot victory this year. Take a look at the margin for one thousandth of a second. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about Pro Stock Bike. Karen Stouffer, if you were around uh, for any of our early, earlier shows, you know that Karen had problems on qualifying. One of three riders to go down as a result of the outrun. And uh, let's check in with Dave Reef. You know, Marty, those fuel guys and the Pro Stock guys have chassis. You don't. What keeps you safe are your leathers and what an important job they do. 
Yeah, you know, my base leathers, they did an awesome job for me, as you can see, and my only wound I had here was my little elbow. But one of the reasons why, and I'm not the expert on leathers, but I can tell you that it's the type of leather that you use that's very important, and the fact that the stitching never ripped on this, that's like the weakest link. And when after I crashed, I had NHRA re-inspect these. They do a rigorous check, and I was actually successful enough. They said these are in great shape, and you can go ahead and run again. So base leathers did it. More with Karen in just a moment. All right, thanks, Dave. As uh, we get ready back up the starting line, Greg Anderson, the number one qualifier, survived first round. Kurt Johnson is one of two guys to beat Greg this year. Can he do it here? Red light, KJ. For the first time this season, Kurt Johnson has given one away by going red. 6.85 seconds, a 6.86 is what Kurt threw away. He's not going to be a very happy camper. As uh, he coasts on out, let's uh, talk to Ricky Smith because he's going to his second semi of the year. Ricky Smith, let me see. You either won 25 IHRA titles or five. Which one? I won seven. Seven. Two whole shot victories today. Hey, it's, it's a good deal. I'm finally getting the car where I'm comfortable with it. You know, the team's getting good. Hey, dark performance. I'm tickled to death for everybody right here, right now, Bill. We needed these rounds. We just need to do good, and I'm glad I'm driving, you know. Hey, I ain't too old to do this stuff. <laughs> you can do it. Dave, back with Karen Stouffer. Plans underway to return in English Town, but you want to clarify some things from yesterday. Yeah, I know there's a lot of speculation and a lot of conversation going on about what happened as far as uh, the riding and all the riders going down, but mine's still under investigation. We went over the videotapes quite a few times, and we still don't know. There was no brake issue in mine that there was no brakes grabbed, so I just want to make sure everybody's safe out there, and we have a great racing safe weekend. All right, thank you, Karen. It'll be great to see her back out at the next event. We get ready now for Steve Johns in the left lane, Bruce Allen over in the right. Stevie, of course, went all the way to the semifinals last time out at Topeka. Bruce Allen hasn't been to a semifinal since Bristol earlier this year. And again, looks like we're going to have a bit of a staging duel. Hope nobody has a plane to catch. Rick Stewart checking his watch. I'm getting my edition of War and Peace out. This is the longest one we've had all year. Who's going in first? Whole shot win for Bruce Allen. He was first off the line. 6.90 to a quicker but losing 6.89. So the old veteran, the 53-year from Arlington, Oh, he was good. We gotta check in now with Parker. Marty, as we've seen, cylinder head specialist James Riola does a lot more than work on cylinder heads. James, you've told us that you like to service existing cylinder heads. I see you've put on two new heads. Why? Well, the existing heads had a little burned up chamber, so we're gonna put new ones on. What will you be doing over the next five minutes? Putting this head on. Now, I saw that you've been giving uh, some information back to crew chief Ron Tobler. What have you been telling him? Uh, just telling him what I see so he can make a decision. Now, do you end up changing cylinder head gaskets for uh, changing compression ratios in between runs if necessary then? That's one of the decisions that he makes. Awfully busy down here, Marty. Well, and I, I also know it sounds like Jim just doesn't want to give away any of the family secrets. <laughs> One of the things he's talking about, too, when he talks about looking and changing the head, he'll tell how, Ron Tolder how much the combustion chamber burnt. He'll, look, he'll compare that information with the computer to, to be able to make the adjustments for the new set of heads that are going on there. All right, let's get back to pro stock. On the line is Jason Line. He'll be in the left lane up against Dave Conley. Both cars pre-staged, and are we going to do this again? No, here we go. Jason has to get out of the throttle. So Dave Conley at 6.93 seconds is going on to the semifinals. He'll match up against Ricky Smith. So a bit of a surprise there as uh, Jason Line, the teammate to Greg Anderson, as uh, we get ready for the semifinals, it will be Ricky with the lane choice over Dave Conley as by uh, the margin of a 6.89 to a 6.93. And over in the other semifinal matchup, 
It will be Greg Anderson with the lane choice by five one hundredths over Bruce Allen. We've got Pro Stock Bike coming up uh, next, but uh, you're looking at the work going on back in Doug Coletta's camp. Stay with us. Back here at the Pontiac Excitement Nationals, it's time for second round action in Pro Stock Bike. And you got Steve Johnson in the left lane, Keith Dennis in the right lane. It is Steve Johnson, 7.29 seconds, 183 miles an hour, taking the win here as they quickly came firing off the line. Now, let's uh, show you what the ladder looks like. We were going to try and sneak that in before they fired off, but uh, you can see it's got uh, Andrew Hines, Gino Scali with lane choice on uh, one side, and over on the other, it will be, as you can see already, Steve Johnson advancing and Angel Savoie with the lane choice over Sean Gann. Now, let's go back to uh, the funny car in the last uh, round, and John Forrest going red by almost a full tenth of a second, and there he is. Let's go to Dave. John, what happened up at the start line? Obviously, driver. I'm so mad at myself. I don't usually get mad. I'm so mad I can't see straight. Uh, they were vulnerable here in the heat. Uh, this points lead could have been pushed by Warsham and myself, and that's what I hate to give it away on driver error, but uh, I got too amped up, and I went up there and did a stupid thing, red light. And uh, my car was perfect. Eric did his job, took out Baysmore, gave me the perfect hand, and I choked it. So what do you want me to say? Fans are still very supportive. Heard one of them say, hey, John, it's tough to be perfect all the time, but we still love you. Well, I don't think John has to say anything else. I mean, I think you've got the full gist of it right there. As uh, we're ready now for GT Tonglet and one of the Screaming Eagles Harleys against uh, Gino Scali and the Team Trim Tech Suzuki. Defending Powerade champion closest to you in the left lane. Scally with a great light. The win goes to Gino Scally, a whole shot. 7.22 seconds to the quicker but losing 720. And it was the three 100s advantage that was the difference back at the starting line. And there it is, 75, 10 thousandth of a second, the margin of victory. So as Gino uh, rolls on out, now we get ready for Angel Savoie against Sean Gann. Already, Gann is pre-staged. Rematch of the Atlanta final. You remember, that's where Angel won. And she did it again. 7.21 seconds, 184 miles an hour. So no matter what's going on in her private life, she has been able to focus and concentrate. And here we go. She's trying to get the bike stopped before crossing over the road and right there at Refugee Road, she'll make the stop. So uh, let's uh, talk to Stevie Johnson. He's at that far end of the racetrack as well, and he's with Bill. And you can always pick him out in a crowd with that Dayglow driving suit, but uh, hey, you know what? You got a bike that might be able to go the distance today. Yeah, uh, we've been working really hard on this bike, and you know, I just can't say enough about all these things that have been happening. You know, motorcycles have been crashing at this race, and you know, I go by, I took my front brake handle off the bike, threw it away, and went by and let the clutch out and let the engine slow it down. Hollered at everybody, I'm still up, I'm still up, I haven't crashed. But run and shine in the second round. Uh, little games, uh, you know, we go back to the Pro Star. AMA Pro Star is really where we're born and where we uh, cultivate some of our uh, roots in racing and pro stock. But it's great to see him. Shine, shine, you got to turn around for radio or TV, whatever this is. But anyway, it's great to be here. Okay, gives us just enough time to tell you. It's Andrew Hines left lane, Anton Brown in the right. Perfect light by Anton. But it's not enough. Andrew goes 7.21 seconds, 188 miles an hour. Antron goes 7.25 in the losing effort. And again, everybody's sort of taking as much of the road as they need, as we've had all kinds of problems getting these Pro Stock bikes stopped at the far end of the racetrack. Man, watch Andrew Hines at the end of this run. We've been talking about this. He's going to get this thing loose, and his foot's going to go down to save it. Look at it right there, boy. That was real close. Foot didn't quite have to go all the way to the ground. He saved it before then. But I'll tell you, 
That got his attention, I'll guarantee you. Take a look at this and think about this. This is two perfect lights in a row against Andrew, and he's managed to still win both rounds. That is spectacular. 79, 10 thousandth of a second, the margin. Here are the matchups. Andrew's got lane choice over Gino Scali. This is going to be a dandy by 1, 100. And over the other, Angel with the lane choice by a little bit more. 8 one hundredths of a second over Steve Johnson. We'll have top fuel when we return back here to Columbus. We're back at the Pontiac Excitement Nationals. It's round 10 of the NHRA Powerade Drag Racing Series. And we're glad you're with us as we're getting ready for semifinal action. And you can see it'll be Daryl Russell with the lane choice over Larry Dixon in one of our top fuel semifinals. And then in the other matchup we're getting ready to see, Doug Coletta and Tony Schumacher. It is the points leader, Tony Schumacher, with the lane choice. And uh, in case you hadn't noticed, there is the paint scheme for the celebration of 229 years. It's a birthday this weekend for the United States Army, and that's the magazine cover from time when the Army was person of the year. And we send our best to all of our troops in Iraq. Right now, Tony's trying to go to his fifth final this year, as is Doug Coletta. You know, these guys between them, they've gone to 71 finals. Guess what? Tony Schumacher, 4.62 seconds. The Army of One is marching on. It will be his 36th career final, fifth up this year. Let's take another look. What can you say about Alan Johnson? I mean, he only got down the racetrack one run at qualifying. Boy, in elimination, what a difference a day makes. I mean, this car looked very good all day long. He's just reading the racetrack just perfect and making sure this thing goes from A to B. Doesn't want to smoke the tires. This is a nice run. Track conditions are still pretty warm out there. You don't see any tire smoke out there. Just popping that left front end, front tire up there. Just a little bit as the clutch stages are coming in. No tire smoke and gets the wind line. And Tony celebrating at the far end. And uh, Dave Reef, I think you're with one of our fighting men and women. You bet. Home from Operation Iraqi Freedom. This is Specialist Tyree Stevens from the 259th Movement Control Team. Back home in Columbia. Columbus back home after an eight-month stint in Iraq. Rising. Yeah, I just got back. I'm happy to be back. I'd like to thank all the people that supported us while we was over there. And uh, it's good to be home. We had an interesting conversation. You gave me one word for the descriptions over there. Tell it to me again. Hot. How hot? They saw a heat index, Bill Stevens, of 147 degrees. Glad to have him home, though. I'll tell you another hot entity. It's Tony Schumacher. Three times right down the fairway today, Tony. Yeah, you know, and after doing the... The last three qualifying runs, we didn't make it, but Ellen Johnson, you know, when I used to race against them, they'd do it to us. You'd go out there thinking these guys didn't get down the track qualifying, and they'd go out there and go right down the track on race day. We're so glad to have them on our team right now. Obviously, 229th Army birthday this weekend. We got three soldiers from Iraq. Uh, just as awesome. Time Magazine Person of the Year car. This is an impressive car. Indianapolis was the last time we did a special car, and we won that. Let's hope we have as much luck this time. Well, and if you look back to last year, that's how Larry Dixon won the race. He only had one good qualifying run. And uh, he's trying to go for four in a row, but he's got to get past this guy, Daryl Russell. Let's get more from Parker. You know, we talked about Daryl Russell's new car. You know why they changed it, Marty? Simply to increase their luck. They said there was nothing wrong with the old car. It didn't have too many runs on it. They just needed a change in fortune, and they're hoping that that new chassis will get him into the winner's circle today. Dr. Dick LaHaye going into the sand trap is so much of an afterthought because this team is really struggling with getting this car down the racetrack right now. They dodged a bullet in the second round and still don't have a clear idea how to do it. So this is going to be a pretty crucial run. Third time in four years that these two have met here in Columbus. It's getting to be like an annual affair. is going to his second final of the year and 17th of his career. 5.38, and the computers all are fouled up as far as time. That's why you see all the perplexed looks on everybody's face because uh, the timing system did not work properly. And there is Joe Amato, and he's saying, did we win, did we win? And Rick Stewart is saying, yeah, you won. Now it's given the win in the scoreboard to Larry Dixon. 
Marty, it's obvious that Daryl Russell won the race, but one of the key things here, if they had a malfunction in the timing and he's not able to get a time, I mean, they do have backup clocks they can go to, but if there is no time, then what's going to happen with lane choice? Because lane choice right now seems to be very critical. And there is Don Perdome talking to uh, Ray Alley. And there is Daryl Russell. He's wanting to know what is going on as well. Joe Amato. Oh, this could get very interesting. So it is Tony Schumacher and Daryl Russell in the final, but we can't really tell you as to who has lane choice. We'll go to the backup clocks and see if we can figure it out when we come back. Well, back here at the Pontiac Excitement Nationals, we have plenty of excitement. They are working on the clocks, and we have been told that uh, Tony Schumacher will get the lane choice. No official time with Daryl Russell. The good news is we send it to you, Bill. Daryl has now jumped all the way up from sixth to fourth in the championship points chase. Well, the big thing for him, though, is that officially you will not have lane choice and you're a little puzzled Daryl because you've been in the 50s all day and that run felt as strong as the other two absolutely it felt just as strong if not stronger I mean I always look at the tree when I leave and I saw the green so I knew I didn't red light across the finish line I didn't see the wind light coming I never heard Larry so I was like oh, you know what's going on here but uh you know, it's kind of a bummer because it really didn't feel strong, and I think we would have had enough to have lane choice. There's no question about it, but, you know, we don't have any numbers on our side, so what do you do? I mean, they have to do what's best, and so Tony's going to get it, but we'll address that later. You know, I mean, we're just going to go out there and get ready for this final round now. That's all we can do. And by the way, no wind light appeared on Tony Schumacher's scoreboard when he won his run. All right, here is the Funny Car Ladder presented by Lucas Oil. Dell Worsham and Phil Burkhardt, teammates, going at it again. And dell has got the lane choice. And then over in our second matchup, it will be Eric Medlin with the lane choice over Gary Selfie. So we know for sure that one of the CSK cars is going to the finals. Dell can really start picking up some points. He's cut Billy Bazemore's lead to 61, could cut it to 41 right here. And Dell does it, 4.92 seconds. You saw Phil get out about, oh, 330 feet, and then all of a sudden, the tires went up in smoke, and Dell advances to the final third of this year, 27th of his career. There seems to be a pattern in that right-hand lane. This is why lane choice is going to be so critical for the final round. A lot of cars in that right-hand lane are spinning the tires about three to 400 feet. Dell Worsham, not the case. He was hooked up. Nice run. Wasn't real aggressive, but you can't be in these kind of conditions. You've got to get the car to the finish line. He's going to hope that'll hold up for lane choice in the final. Well, as Dell is getting out, there's news back in the pits. Parker. There certainly is. Marty, conspicuous by his absence today in the pits of Larry Morgan Racing, Bob Glidden. Something's been going on here I'm with crewman Paul Yates. Larry Morgan refused to talk to us. Paul, what can you tell us? Uh, right now, we're in a situation that is not written in stone, and we prefer at this time to not say anything. And at a later date, we will. Well, Mike, what does that mean? <laughs> Be able to be a fan of the Clinton administration to figure that one out because I got no clue. Well, obviously, something is going on, and it can't be all positive for uh, everybody if we'd be talking about it. So we'll keep you posted. We'll know for sure by the time we get to English Town in a week. Right now, let's focus our attention back to Gary Selzy and Eric Benlin. Gary in the right lane, and let's go to the far end and talk to Bill. All right, we'll throw out that 619 in the last round. Other than that, a couple of good, strong 490s, and you're ready for the final. Yeah, now we are. I'll tell you, the 619, uh, apparently something was just wrong with the car. You know, it doesn't do that. And we tried to go back in our books and find a run like that and had to go way back, you know, deep into last year to find a run that did that. But check your truck dragon car, you know. Left the line great. Had all its owners running. Champions Mark looked at him running. My dad. Again, just did a great job tuning. The entire team did a great job holding them back together again, and I am very much looking forward to this final round. Yeah, he's looking forward to winning after getting a couple earlier in the season. Well, young Eric Bedlin is also looking forward to going to back-to-back -back finals. Can he double up? It would be the second time this year that he could do it. Uh, over in the other lane, Gary Selden trying to go to his second final of the year, 42nd of his storied career. You know, it's a situation if you're Eric Medlin or, or John Medlin, his crew chief and his dad, you know, you want to win the round, but lane choice does seem to be critical. I'm sure he's probably going to shoot to try to run a high 480 uh, pass and get uh, lane choice. One of the advantages to running second in, in, in the deal because he can see what uh, Dell ran ahead of him and he knows whether he's got the right setup or not. Gary 
Selzy in a hole shot. 4.93 to the quicker, but losing 491. Selzy had almost five one hundredths of a second in the bank off of the starting line. Take a look at the photo finish, as that is how close it was. Second reaction time loss for Eric Medlin this year. Final matchups, it will be Dell Worsham with the lane choice by one one hundredth of a second. This should be a dandy. We've got to take commercial break, and there is Gary Selzy getting ready to come out from uh, inside the Hemi Dodge Pro Stop when we come back. It is round 10 of the NHRA Powerade Drag Racing Series. We're at National Trail Raceway for the 40th running of the Pontiac Excitement Nationals. Semifinals in Pro Stock and the Factory Hot Rods, Greg Anderson has lane choice over Bruce Allen in one of our semifinals. And in the other, it is Ricky Smith with the lane choice over young Dave Conley. And that's going to be the one we're going to focus in on first. This could be interesting at the starting line. You've got the wily old 50-year-old veteran of Ricky Smith against the 21-year-old Dave Conley. Both of them love to play on the tree. And both of them are very good on the tree. Uh, you know, Ricky Smith over the years has been a master of that. But I'll tell you, the new kid on town in town, Dave Connolly, I mean, he's as good as they come right now. So this will be a, this will be interesting to see what happens. Ricky's two wins to get this far today, both on hole shots. Here we go. Both cars three stage. Who's going to go in first, or are we going to have another staging duel? I was sort of expecting this. Want to go see Shrek 2? I've already seen it. Oh, was it good? Yeah, no, it wasn't it's bad. not as good as the first one. <laughs> look, look at Rick Stewart. <laughs> Rick's even got a cigarette and Grump's on the cigar. We're up to 30 seconds and counting. Oh, and the fans are loving it. They're just standing by on the rail. You know, back in 1997, Daryl Alderman and Bruce Allen did this. They were counted out by Buster Couch at this very event. Listen to the crowd in the background. We're up to one minute and counting. Smith is in. Advantage Conlon. to Conley in a hole shot. 6.90 seconds to the quicker but losing 688. And for Conley, it is his fifth hole shot win of this year. And he is going to the finals. His second of the year and second of his career. And there is the margin. And let's go quickly to Bill. He's with Gary Selzy. Let's put a period on Funny Car. He sells you the three words every driver loves to hear on a whole shot. Uh, yeah, usually I'm on the other end of that. I, I got to say hi to or happy birthday to Dave Carcanis, his mom. He forgot. He's got the card. He's going to get it handled. But I got to tell you something. We went up there. Shut up. It's my interview. You lost on a whole shot. Now get out of here. Um, you know, Zippy came up to me and said, look, we can't run 86. He said, so I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. We're going to run a low 90. He said, you're going to do your job on the starting line because I believe in you. And the guy does. And that makes me feel good. And Oakley, Mopar, and everybody. And Matco Tools, we love you to death. But it's a final round, and it's not complete unless you win it. So we'll see what happens. Eric, oh, sorry, out of time. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> yeah, he's a good sport. But uh, I'll tell you. Right now, all eyes on Greg Anderson. As you can see, we're still tracking his road to the history books again. Bruce Allen, one of those protagonists back in 97. He knows what it's like to be there a long time, but he's already in. Here we go. Oh, and big advantage, Bruce. But at the finish line, it's not enough. Greg Anderson drives around him. Wife Kim is happy with that result. 6.83 seconds. 201 miles an hour. And uh, let's go to the far end. And uh, Bill, how long is it going to take you to talk to both these guys? We're going to have to shorten the interview because of how long it took you to stage. Let's start with Ricky Smith, the old pro. You have been in a few of those during your career, but the 21-year-old, he was equal to it. Yeah, no, he done a good job. Hey, we, we went up and raced hard. We really, really figured he'd outrun us, but we made a good run that lane. What were you thinking getting up there? Oh, I know uh, Ricky likes playing them games. He's, he's good at it. And, uh, I, I kind of liked going last, and uh, when he had lane choice, I forgot I was going to do anything I can to turn the wind light on. 
and uh, we did. So all them guys are doing an awesome job. And this kid is made out of ice, isn't he? It was uh, fun to watch, actually, as uh, it's a part of the sport. And it will be Greg Anderson with the lane choice by seven one hundredths over Dave Conley in the Pro Stock Final. There is Greg as we uh, get ready for Pro Stock Bike. And Angel Savoie and Steve Johnson come to the line quickly. Here is the matchups. Andrew Hines has lane choice over Gino Scali in the second semifinal. And in the first one coming up, it is... Angel with the lane choice over Steve Johnson. There is Steve looking to go to his first final since Reading 2001. He's got the advantage off the starting line. And he's got his trip to the final. 7.32 seconds to a 7.36. Angel's performance fell way off. And now, as uh, he was describing earlier, it's a matter of not getting on that front brake and getting the bike stopped. Both are okay. So for Steve Johnson, his first final of the year in his sixth of his career. Let's see if we can see what happened. Well, it was all in the launch. Angel was way off, whether she just missed on the clutch setup or what. Mark Pizer, crew chief, usually pretty good. Maybe something happened. She was 116 and 60 feet. That's about 800 slower than she normally is, and that just carried on the rest of the way down the racetrack, and all she could do was watch Steve Johnson pull away. All right, so now we get ready for our next pair. They're all ready. Got the motors fired and ready to go. It's Andrew Hines and Gino Scali. And uh, this this should be a dandy. I mean, their elapsed times from the last round, one one hundredth of a second difference. Yeah, Marty, this is a great matchup. Uh, you know, both of these riders have been running very, very well. And uh, they're both prone to red light every now and then or cut good lights or be late. You never know what's going to happen with these two on the starting line. Gino Scali has yet to make it to a final this year as the defending Power A champion. Can he? Mark Andrew. Slight advantage, Gino, but he's drifting. Andrew has got the win light. 7.13 seconds, 187 miles an hour. His third trip to the finals this year. Gino Scali's gonna have to wait just a little bit longer. Down here with Steve Johnson. Neither one of us can remember the last final you've been in. <laughs> 1821. No, actually, it's it's fun to be here. We're trying to start a second team. We need money. Call us. What uh, what's really fun is it's beating up on the army. It's not really fun to go home and tell everybody about. But I'm going to uh, just try what we can do with a screaming eagles or, or screaming chickens. At 600 pounds, five, they're 575. Fuel injection, carburetors, all that stuff. But it'll be fun. Let's go over to Angel, who, well, had bad timing to have her slowest run of the weekend against Steve Johnson. What happened? Uh, we bogged the bike really bad, but you know what? It's the United States Army's birthday, 229 years. We got a special paint job for the American soldier who was person of the year. We had a good weekend. I'm proud of us. And there's Andrew Hines over there who will be taking on Steve Johnson in the final round. And the Harley has been on a tear this weekend. Can it keep up? Back to Columbus in just a moment. Let's talk about our cash flow startup of the day. At the top reaction times in Pro Stock Bike, Riddell Harris, he went 0, 0, 0. That's perfect. Then 007 for Mark Powick in Pro Stock. Doug Coletta at 009, which is phenomenal in top fuel. And Ron Caps at 072 in round one of Funny Car. So it's time for the finals, and let's set the show for you. Will it be Daryl Russell or Tony Schumacher taking home the Wally in top fuel? They'll worship Gary Selzy in Funny Car. Young Dave Conley against the Wiley champion. And that is Greg Anderson. Yeah. Of course, Andrew Hines and Steve Johnson will be first. And here they come. Steve Johnson, 189 races. He's been here longer in Pro Stock Bike than any other active rider without a national championship event win. Here's his chance. He's been to, well, this is his sixth final now. Well, you know, and he's against Andrew Hines, so you would think he probably wouldn't have a chance, but you probably thought that the previous round when he had to race uh, Angel, so anything can happen. In the past, he's been beaten in the finals by Angel Savoie, Andrew's brother Matt, twice by John Myers, and once by the great Dave Schultz. So he hasn't been losing to any slouches, that's for sure. But can he pull it off here? The performance advantage has to be given to Andrew as we are ready to go. Say goodnight. never in doubt 7.13 seconds 185 miles an hour Andrew was first off the starting line and by a bunch he was first to the strike 
So for Andrew, he picks up his second win of the year. And look at Andrew Hines. Not much wrong here, like you said, Marty. Got the jump off the starting line. Made sure he got a good green light off the start, unlike he did the previous race, and just took it right down the middle of the race into the winner's circle. It's going to stretch his points lead in the uh, class to 119 over Sean Gann and 130 over GT Tonglet. So uh, a little bit of air to spare now for Andrew. You remember, you get 20 points per round. And there are the official points after five of 15 national events in Pro Stock uh, Bike. You see that Angel is in fourth. Gino Scali rounds out the top five. Let's go to Bill. Well, we began the weekend by making some hay about that Buell that made its debut this weekend. But when all was said and done, Andrew, the Screaming Eagle V-Rod is in the winner's circle. Man, this Harley Davidson is fast. Whew. Man, my lights have been consistent all weekend. I don't care what Steve says about my Screaming Eagle. But uh, this bike has just been so consistent this weekend. We've been, been, been making progress with horsepower. And my dad, Byron Hines, is tuning this bike so well that it's just awesome that he can be out here winning with the Harley Davidson now. All right, thank you, Andrew. Congratulations. And let's talk about Greg Anderson and Dave Conley because Dave Conley at age 21 can win his first national event at the very track where his engine builder, Bill Grumpy Jenkins, won his very last national event back in 1975. That's 29 years ago, but he's gonna have to nail the tree. This is actually a rematch of the uh, King Demon Crown shootout. Here we go. Conley was first off the starting line, but 6.85 seconds later, it is Greg Anderson picking up his 24th career win that ties him for fifth on the active list now with Jim Yates. And you saw the disappointment on Grumpy Jenkins' face. The Vegas general machine just unstoppable. Yeah, just a tough break. Dave Conley got the jump off the starting line, but Greg Anderson had made up that difference of 60 feet and then just carried it on the west of the way down the track. Just what can you say about it? The horsepower, the track, the driving, it's just a complete package there. Take a look at the points because Greg could basically just about take off five races and Kirk Johnson would have to win them all for him to be able to even catch up. That's how big the margin is. In fact, look at this, from fourth on down, Greg scored over 500 points more than the rest of the field. That is just incredible. Let's go to Bill. Greg Anderson, you know, I watch you do this, I watch you win, and the enthusiasm never wanes. Every time you have one of those in your hand, it's like it's the first one all over again. It does feel that way, I swear. I, don't, I hope it never goes away, and I know it never will. You know, I appreciate this so much. It is so tough out here, so hard to win. Today's my wife's birthday. Everybody knows Kim. They see her on the starting line every time jumping around. It's her birthday. Happy birthday, honey. Brittany, my daughter is not here. I wish she'd have been here. Cody's here. My father, Father's Day coming up. A little bit early for that, but still a pretty good Father's Day present. Pontiac, thank you so much. Summit, appreciate everything you guys do. Mac Tools, thank you so much. Manly Bell, Redline Oil. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Dave's with the runner-up. -run. Dave Conley, 22 on the tree, but you got to keep getting these finals. Your day's coming. Yeah, hopefully it'll come soon. It was just cool to get in the final at our, uh, face our home track. We had a lot of friends and family here, so uh, we had to switch motors for the last round, so a few little things happened, but, I mean, Greg was running good anyway. All, a lot better than we were all weekend, but I just got to thank, uh, uh, thank the competition, Macco, all these guys. I mean, they're, or Mac Tools, sorry about that. <laughs> they're helping us out, and uh, thanks to everyone on the team. They did a good job hustling and getting our motor changed. Dave uh, lives in Elyria, Ohio, about an hour and a half away from the track. Time now for Funny Car. Dell Worsham and Gary Selzy. And Selzy can really help his teammate Whit Bazemore because Bazemore leads the points right now by 41. But Dell with a win obviously cuts that down to 21. And Gary Selzy would definitely like to do that right now. He doesn't have lane choice. He's in that right lane, but he was able to get down that lane and make a good run in the previous session. They need to do this again if they want to get around Dell Worsham. Parker? Gary Selzy's success today, it's been one of philosophy. He said he and his crew chief, Mike Neff, have been looking for steak and lobster when they should have been settling for a chicken dinner. He said they just backed everything off, tried to make it run like a bracket car, and so far, that strategical change has worked great for them today. Parker, after being lost most of eliminations, Chuck Worsham says they found a tune-up in the semifinals that they feel very confident about. 
confident enough that they left it alone for the final round. Pedal job. And the wind light goes to Dow Worsham. White Connie is loving it. A tire smoking affair, and boy, has he earned it today. Two times he has had to pedal the car. Look at the frustration on Don Schumacher's face as he turns as dejected as you can imagine. Parker. Chuck Worsham, congratulations. Win number three, and your son is the one that's gotten it done today. Oh, this is his trophy this time. He drove us the whole way. You know, we had nothing but mechanical glitches all weekend, and um, this is definitely the driver's race. The driver still counts. Uh, a little bit, huh? <laughs> It is Dell's 17th career win, third of this year, and that number 17 now ties him with Whit Bazemore in the same category for career wins. So uh, the points championship Titans, they have the same amount of career wins. And as uh, he gets out of the car, we take a look at the points and look at the gap. 21 between first and second, then it drops to 83 with John, Eric, Gary, Selsey has moved all the way from seventh up to fifth, so still a good weekend for Gary, despite the fact yep. he takes the runner-up trophy today. Let's go to Bill. Don't worship him. Cussing inside the car again? Uh, absolutely. You know, I just couldn't believe it when the thing went out there and smoked tires. Uh, we just didn't change anything there. You know, we left everything alone and thought we'd be okay, and uh, apparently we weren't, you know. Goodyear didn't want to see stick. They didn't want to stuck the track, but you know, checker trucks, Craig and Monte Carlo, Mac Tools, everybody at GM. It's their race. We won it for them. We're the first ones to finish line. That's really all that matters. <laughs> you say that again. We talked at the beginning of the day of how at three race stretch, Dell Worsham lost the points lead, and then could they come back? Well, he has come back to within 21. And he did a great job here, Marty. They both smoked the tires right at the same point. At half track, they ran identically lap time, same miles an hour as they were both smoking the tires. But Del Worsham, Pelle, one more time, was able to get the thing to recover and just carry that speed a little bit ahead of Gary Shelsey, who also did a good job. Neither driver could complain about the job they did here. Just that Del Worsham got the better end of it this time. And at the other end of the track, there is the blower askew on Gary Selzy's car. Back at the starting line, the side-by-side -side burnouts. Daryl Russell in the right lane, Tony Schumacher in the left. The last race of the day, can Tony Schumacher pick up his fifth win of the year? He's never had that many in a single season ever in his career see his road to the final. For Daryl Russell, he's trying to just get back into the winner's column. I mean, it's been a long time since he has won a national event. Well, Marty, you have the two best cars here in the final. They've really been running. Both teams have been doing a good job today. It's unfortunate that Daryl Russell didn't get a lap time in the semifinals. He might have had lane choice. I think there's a slight difference in the lanes. I think off the starting line, they're both about the same. The right lane may be a little bit slicker, maybe three or 400 feet down track, but not a big difference. Uh, in any case, crew chief Wayne Dupuis has got to race the lane, make sure it goes from A to B and gets down the track, as does Tony Schumacher, and hopefully the best car will win. It's been almost two years since Daryl has been to victory as it was uh, Seattle back in 2002. There is Joe Amato celebrating his 60th birthday. Is it going to be a party or is the candle about to be blown out by the army of one? Dupuis crosses himself. He is wanting this one badly. Both cars pre-staged. Here we go. You had to justify buying that new car when one wasn't justified. You know all about superstition and good luck. It worked. Well, it worked. You know, the buck almost got us for lane choice, but Wayne and the whole team have been a great job. You know, we've, it's been a year since we got a winner's circle, and we're really working hard trying to get to a sponsor for next year. And all the people that, you know, the Keystone, all the people from DZ and Valvoline that have hung with us and Model Light and Fram, and they gave us great parts and support. And I can't say enough. You know, I, my birthday. You know, I've had a, what a birthday present, huh? Happy birthday, Joe. Marty? 
And there's Joe celebrating, and what a close finish. What a great drag race. There is Daryl Russell. And he has jumped from seventh to fourth in the points. Let's go to Bill. Twice, Daryl Russell, in the last three years you've been denied here, but to finally do it on Joe's birthday, how perfect is that? Bill, I can't tell you. This team has worked so hard. These guys, I mean, the hours they put in to try to get this car to be consistent, and it looks like it's finally shown some signs of life. I mean, I, I can't say enough. I mean, it's been almost two years, and it's so easy to doubt yourself when you're not winning races and thinking all the things you could be doing better. But, man, I'm telling you, for this whole team, all of our sponsors, DZ, Driver FX, Valvoline, Mac Tools, all you guys, we can't thank you enough. But, man, this is fantastic. We'll be back in just a moment to Columbus. Thanks. So for Mike Dunn, Bill Stevens, Dave Reed, Parker Johnstone, and our entire ESPN2 crew, I'm Marty Reed. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Pontiac Excitement National. We've got NCAA Super Regionals coming up next right here on ESPN2. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com. We'll see you next weekend in Hi, English baby. Town. So long, everybody. <laughs> Hi, yeah.